Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. Came a long word. I double dog dare you to have some fun with a family member or friend and see if they can pronounce it. <laughs> it probably took me six months to pronounce it easily. Anyway, I am your national IC support group leader. It is my job to uh, educate you, to empower you, to support you, to give you options to open doors. If you're not responding to therapy and not getting better, we want to understand why. If you're not sure of your diagnosis, you're doing bladder therapies and they're not helping, or you're just so other things are going on, like you're having your double bowel, vulvodynia, things like that. That's what I'm here for. I want to try to give you context. I want to try to give you help because my goal is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. I don't want anybody messing with you, right? <sighs> yeah. So happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy, happy Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a little tricky. You know, when you're single, it's uh, not necessarily the easiest day in the world. Oh, gosh. Hold on a sec. My microphone. Holy moly. Let's make sure our microphone is okay. Y'all, can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer, you guys, how is the sound? Is the sound okay? Hello, Barbara. It's nice to see you, hon. Happy Valentine's Day. Right back to you. Okay, so Barbara says the sound is good on YouTube. Hey, guys, how is the sound on Facebook? Are y'all okay? Can you hear me okay? Jennifer says, can I get information on Botox injection? Sure. Well, botulinum toxin. Uh, botulinum toxin is what they originally started using for wrinkles on your forehead. You know, it basically turns off nerves for a period of time. So it has been used for many, many conditions, from cosmetic procedures to... TMJ. And yes, Botox has been used in the bladder. It can be used on the bladder wall or it can be used on the pelvic floor muscles. Um, our challenge here with using it in the bladder is that basically, uh, you know, so the way they do Botox is you do a hydro distension so that they can get inside your bladder and look at your bladder well. Then they do injections. And they will just kind of do random injections throughout the bladder wall. And the problem here is that if they accidentally turn off the nerve that you use to urinate, you may have to self-catheterize for a period of time. And that is why Botox was originally a, a step five treatment option. We have six steps of treatment for interstitial cystitis that are arranged with respect to the risk of adverse events. So the American Urology Association wants you to do the easy stuff before you do the stuff that has significant side effects. The challenge here with Botox is there can be significant side effects, specifically urine retention. And that is why if you look at the FDA approval for Botox, it's not to be done for people who are unable to self-catheterize, that's for the elderly. And that's kind of one of the things that Botox done in uh, convalescent catheterized. So they're kind of breaking that FDA rule. Um, and so again, originally a step five treatment option because of that profound risk. Additional studies showed, however, that if they reduce the dose by 50%, the urinary retention improved, the risk of urinary retention. Thus, Botox is now a step four treatment option. That said, it can still cause urinary retention. And if uh, a one of the rare side effects occurs. And one IC patient had Botox therapy that accidentally got it into her bloodstream and it literally put her into serious cardiac issues. Her heart stopped. They had to get things going. She was in ICU for a week or two before things got better. So that's why we have six steps of therapy. We want you to do the easy stuff before you do the hard stuff. Hello, Lisa from freezing cold Houston. Yeah, man, you guys are going through the polar vortex. Hello. Ashley says, can I see to turn into something worse over time? I have our time giving up coffee every day. So I just deal with the pain to have a little coffee. So Ashley, fundamental subtypes for Christopher Payne. 
So to run down our subtypes really quick, so lesions, subtype two, bladder wall driven, subtype three, pelvic floor driven, subtype four, pudendal neuralgia, subtype five, central sensitization. So here's the problem with that one cup of coffee a day. If you've got Hunter's lesions or you've got estrogen atrophy from, from IC subtype two, uh, or if you have central sensitization, the problem is, is that coffee is neurostimulatory. It turns nerves on. That's why people drink coffee in the morning. It helps you have a bowel movement, right? I mean, that's a great part about doing coffee, but it also makes you pee more. So if you're struggling with urinary frequency urgency, the last thing you want to do is stimulate the nerve so you have to pee more, right? But the far more serious issue with coffee is that the acid in the coffee is going to enter any wounds you have in the bladder. So if you've got Hunter's lesions, if you've got bladder wall driven, estrogen atrophy, chemical injury, et cetera, et cetera, your bladder can't heal. It can't heal. You know, I attended a really good lecture by Dr. Anthony Schaefer years ago at the, at, I think, at National Institute of Health IC meeting. And he was talking specifically about the bladder repair, how the bladder repairs itself. It has the largest single cells in the human body. These are giant cells. And so um, uh, they don't get repaired overnight. Uh, it takes two weeks for one urothelial cell to be replaced. So imagine an extra large pizza, and then imagine a little tiny green pea underneath that pizza. So that giant pizza is actually the umbrella cell. That little tiny pea is the stem cell. It takes two weeks for that cell to grow and adapt and change and fill in for the pizza. And what Dr. Schaefer said is while that is growing, while that is growing, it is stunningly vulnerable to acid. And so the conclusion that we left with that pretty much everybody agreed with at that time is one cup of coffee would destroy the next generation of cells. That the, those cells are so fragile, we have to give them time to heal. And so you have to stop coffee for like three months to really give your bladder an opportunity to repair itself. Now, now if you're instead IC subtype four or IC subtype five, I mean, IC subtype three, pelvic floor driven pudendal neuralgia, you might be able to get away with coffee. But if you got Hunter's lesions, bladder wall driven or central, central sensitization, one cup of coffee in the morning is a mistake. However, I have something for you to try. Hold on, let me go get it, hold on. Um, the coffee challenge. So when, when, how do you know when you can drink coffee again? That's the real big question is how do you know when you can drink coffee again? So if you're in a flare, for God's sake, don't drink coffee. I mean, especially if it's a bladder wall flare, this is not the time to be drinking coffee, my friends. But if things are calmed down and you're feeling better, the first thing we want you to try, obviously, herbal tea, right? So chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea, and you can do that during a flare. That would, should not be a problem. If you if you do okay with those, the next thing you do is a brown herbal coffee, a rubose coffee. And we have them in our store. We have a wonderful rubose coffee that I drink almost every day that has never irritated my bladder. So we're going from uh, chamomile peppermint, we're next going to rubose coffee. If you do okay with the rubose coffee, the next step is to try an herbal coffee. And I'm telling you right now, seriously, this is called Dandy Blend. I mean, man, I love coffee. I love the routine of it. I love the smell of it. I love holding it in the morning. I love the taste of it. But my body does not like coffee. I can drink it. You know, I can drink it for about, because remember, I'm not bladder wall driven. I'm sub central sensitization subtype five and subtype three. Um. So every couple of years, I start drinking coffee, usually decaf, and I usually do it during times of great stress. I really love lattes or frappuccinos. So I went to town last fall during fires. My house almost burned down. And eventually what happened after my 
heart starts getting very arrhythmic. Um, so now I'm in the down process of trying to calm my nerves. I still feel it almost every night. I feel that little tiny arrhythmia from that coffee. Um, I got to tell you right now, Dandy Blend, the smell is insanely like coffee. It is so good. It's really dark, really rich. And it's made with, um, let's see, it is made with the chicory and, and where is it? Here we go. Roasted barley, rye, chicory, dandelion root, and sugar beet. Okay. So I can make a latte with this. I can make a frappuccino with this. I can make it super dark. Never flared from it. Never had heart issues from it. No caffeine. But I'm telling you, the smell is incredible. So I just got approved for a wholesale account with this company. So we're going to bring it in uh, soon. And when I have it in, we'll start giving it away. So it, the cool thing about it is it comes it comes in these and you just pour it in a, in a cup. And it's really dark. I mean, it makes a really dark cup of coffee, but it's really good. Um, so, okay. So, again, going back to our coffee challenge is can your bladder tolerate herbal coffee? If it can, then your next step is going to be a low acid coffee, preferably an herbal coffee. And there are several varieties that we suggest. Let's see. Let me get here. So for the... Um, for the low acid coffees, again, if your bladder's tolerated the herbal coffee, then you can try the low acid coffee. You can go with <clears throat> Simpatico. Uh, we've sold this for years and years and years. I see patients love this. You can try Tyler's. Tyler's says he's the world's acid-free coffee. That isn't quite true. There's still a little, little tiny bit of acid in this pH testing shows that this is testing out at like pH 0.6.1 or 6.2 instead of seven, which is pH neutral. But again, it's extremely low acid coffee. And then my personal favorite is Bellarosa coffee. And the reason why Bellarosa coffee is the top dog here in the low acid coffee is because it has the least levels of chlorogenic acid. And chlorogenic acid is the acid that causes the burn, the stomach ache and the bladder ache. And it's because of their roasting method. They have a very specific roasting method that absolutely removes the chlorogenic acid. So I personally love the Bella Rosa coffee. And the cool thing about the Bella Rosa coffee is it has decaf, it has half calf and it has full calf. So you can then try a low acid decaf coffee and, and do that for a couple of months. Just, you know, man, you gotta, you gotta slowly work your way in here. And then finally, finally, if you want to give caffeine a try, do the Bella Rosa half calf and see how you do. You know, you just you just have to see how you do. And of course, one of the other cool things that we have is Preleaf, the sponsor of this of the stream, as a matter of fact. Preleaf is calcium glycerophosphate. It reduces the acid in your stomach from foods that you've eaten. And so you can always take one or two caplets of preleaf before you have something like this, okay? But that's our coffee challenge. Water, chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea, step two. Step three is gonna be a, a, a rubose co uh, herbal coffee. Step four is gonna be a low acid decaf coffee. Um, and then step five is gonna be maybe, you know, well, half calf and then a full calf. Oh, did I do, uh, did I forget to say herbal coffees? Well, you know, come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Hello, Donna. Happy Valentine's Day to you too. Okay. So Ashley, so the question here, getting back to your question, can I see turn into something worse? Yeah, man. If you keep pouring acid on the wound, it's going to get bigger. You'll never get better. If you have Hunter's lesions and you're pouring acid on that wound every day, that you're just provoking the wound and making things rougher. You've got to create an environment that will support your bladder healing. And it's hard, you know? Um, if I'm not drinking coffee, I still think about it every day. I love that ritual of coffee in the morning. And it's so weird is like, seriously, I'm a better writer when I drink coffee. 
but I just can't deal with the racing heart and the arrhythmias at night, which is why, you know, I'm off of it again. Hello, Shirley. Hi, Brianna. Hi, Ashley. Hello, Pamela. Hi, Anne. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Trini. Hello, Cami. Trini said I had an injection into the bladder and it helped a lot. What'd you have? Emily says, yes, now I have a hernia by my left hip, swollen lymph nodes continue to be ignored for treatment. It is making the spasms, urgency, and pain so much worse. Too close to my bladder for comfort. Hmm. <sighs> Question is, why are you, why are you, so the only time my lymph nodes get swollen down there, and you know, you guys, you have lymph nodes basically at the top of each leg, at the crease of your leg to your pelvis. Um, is that um, if I'm, if I have like, um, like a pimple, you know, sometimes you get a pimple down there, you know, that it's usually from friction of some type. And, and until that, until that pimple is gone, my lymph nodes will tend to stay swollen, but you really absolutely want, if you have long-term, and if you've had swollen lymph nodes longer than two weeks, you mean, you, you should call your doctor and have them check that out. Okay. I mean, we got to pay attention to swollen lymph nodes here. Um, also too, you know, the fact that you're having spasms, urgency, and pain that is intensified by the lymph nodes, I would really want to know, is there a chance you have a viral infection in your bladder? Is there a chance you have a fungal infection in your bladder or a bacterial infection? You would be a very good candidate for a next generation urine test. Sylvian says, how can I see get worse as we age? Estrogen atrophy for women. The one way, I mean, the significant way that I see and worsen over time for a woman is just with estrogen atrophy. Your bladder relies on estrogen to produce that nice thick coating of mucus that normally protects your bladder wall. You remember, your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ covered with a thick coating of moisture, mucus. And that purpose of that mucus is a barrier. It protects your bladder wall from irritants and from infection. Unfortunately, that mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, you have lots of mucus. If you have a hysterectomy, if you go on birth control pills or you're perimenopausal or, uh, or menopausal or postmenopausal, guess what? You have less estrogen. That means you have less mucus. Thus, your bladder's ability to defend itself is now compromised. That is not a disease. That is estrogen atrophy. That is aging. And the cool thing about that is that as you give that tissue estrogen, it will begin to produce more mucus. Trini says, Medtronic Interesting will help with free. Let's see. Hello, Maria. Uh, Trini, I don't understand your question. She says, Medtronic Interesting will help with frequency. Uh, uh, if you're talking about inner stem, yes, sacral neuromodulation, uh, pudendal neuromodulation might help with frequency urgency. That is, in fact, why it is FDA approved. It is FDA approved for incontinence and frequency urgency. It can be life-changing for the better for people who have no control over their bowels or their bladder. But you have to understand that neuromodulation is a step four treatment option. It's in step four for a reason. There are a lot of potential side effects. Um, there are thousands of adverse event reports filed over Medtronic's interstim with the US FDA, including fatality. So most people don't start with interstim when you're ready to do neuromodulation. You start with the ankle stimulation known as urgent PC. And that involves no surgery. All they do is stick a needle uh, at your SP6 acupuncture point above your ankle and they put a TENS unit on it and they turn it on and try to re-regulate those nerves. I actually was in the very first, I was in the a patient of the doctor who invented that. It is also FDA for frequency or incontinence. None of them are improved for interstitial cystitis. Um, but when we talk about risk, risks and you being fully, fully informed, it's important that you understand that the risks of surgery, the risks of having an implant are much greater uh, with interstim as compared to um, uh, the urgent PC. We have a whole section on our website on it. Please come on over to icnetwork.org and please read about that. Hello, Maria. I've been trying to get pregnant for years and I have IC. You've had IC for more than nine years. After acupuncture, my pain got to a very, very low level. I surprisingly got pregnant. Awesome, hon. Congratulations. I'm so happy to hear that. 
Uh, we have a pregnancy resource center right on our website, hon. Just go over to icwork.org and you can find it right over there. Anne says, is there an easy hydro distension? Uh, there actually is. Um, there is a new cystoscope called narrow band imaging, which will allow a doctor to identify and uh, Hunter's lesions and look in your bladder wall, look at your bladder wall more closely without requiring any hydro distension. So if your doctor has a narrow band imaging equipment, you wouldn't even need to have a hydro distension unless they wanted you to do some sort of therapy or a biopsy. Uh, also understand that back in the old days, hydro distensions were what we call high pressure, long duration. They filled your bladder up with a lot of fluid and they held it in there for a long period of time. And unfortunately, uh, if you put too much fluid in the bladder, it can rupture. And so quite a few patients over time experience bladder ruptures. I mean, if you've had a hydro distension and you leave the hospital with a catheter, you've had a bladder rupture. Today, if you look at the American Urology Association guidelines, they no longer recommend high pressure. They want low pressure, short duration to reduce any risk of bladder rupture, make it easier on the patient. So the other thing I would be asking your doctor is, will they be doing it a low pressure, short duration as recommended by the American Urology Association? Anne says, are flare vaginal or urethral? You can have both, hun. You can have a vaginal flare. You can have a pelvic floor flare. You can have a bladder wall flare. You can have a urethral flare. The urethral flare is often from chemical irritation or estrogen atrophy. Again, I've got a really good blog, The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain, right over on our website, icnerk.org. Emily says, it's minus 32 in Minnesota. Holy crap, girl. Wow. I can't even imagine what that feels like. DJ says, it's been a rough month for my IC. I've had back-to-back -back infections. First, I had MRSA grow out and went into my kidney. Oh, holy crap. And then three weeks later, I grew out uh, E. coli, ESBL, and Klebsiella. I was a two-for-one special, and the spasms in my bladder and pelvic floor have brought me to my knees. I have even had spasms in my kidneys since I had another kidney. DJ, hon, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I hope, you know... Sometimes we end up chasing infection in the sense that you have one type of infection, you take the antibiotics for that, that kills the infection, but now that's created an environment for another infection to grow and prosper. And that's kind of probably what was going on with you. You, again, perfect candidate for a next generation urine test, but also at the same time, remember that because you have been taking a lot of antibiotics, you definitely want to make sure that you're restoring some good uh, good bacteria, some beneficial bacteria back into your bowel and back into your urinary tract. So most doctors would also tell you to be taking an acidophilus product. So DJ says she went to infectious disease specialist. They recommend that you don't have manipulation of the pelvic floor and the bladder. I'm supposed to start PT. But the, uh, but the doctor said I should have a bath and play music to make my bladder feel better. I, yeah. Well, listen, anytime you put something inside of your body down there, you do run the risk of producing infection. It's very common for people to get infection while they have catheters in, the, in them. They've actually mapped bacterial biofilms moving up the catheter from outside of your body into your body. Um, and so, um, I certainly understand the foundation for that. And I guess what you could say to the pelvic floor physical therapist is, Hey man, I've had these really aggressive infections. Uh, so we need to start externally until the infections have resolved. I think uh, tell your physical therapist, I can't imagine that a physical therapist would want to do internal work given this circumstance, but that doesn't mean that they can't work externally in your lower back or on your hips or on your thighs your core, et cetera, et cetera. Bree says, how do you get classified into a subtype? My doctor has never mentioned this to me. Well, you know, hon, that's because subtyping is really only done by the top tier doctors. This is something that's been happening for about the last 10 years. In Europe, there are 
uh, 12 subtypes, variants of IC. In Canada, they use a system called input, which is a combination of five variants. In, in the United States, we don't have a nationally agreed upon system. I use a system that was invented by Dr. Christopher Payne, who ran the IC research program at Stanford University and chaired National Institutes of Health IC meetings. But these are not taught in medical schools. And so the best thing you can do, to be quite honest, is come on over to our website, watch my video, The Five Subtypes of IC. And then I have a link to the journal article that Chris Payne wrote defining his subtypes. And you can give that to your doctor and say, hey, check this out. This is really changing the face of IC in the United States. We've been subtyping now for five or six years. Um, but, you know, also understand there's a lot of competition among urologists, um, researchers. They not only compete for research money, they also compete for, you know, kind of professional reputation and things like that. And so there's always going to be considerable debate about new things happening. <clears throat> and so right now in the United States, they're still debating a national system. Um, the one thing everybody around the world agrees on is that Hunter's lesions clearly are a different type of IC. No doubt about that. Emily says, I've had a mammogram this week. I got COVID the end of September, then shingles, then installation still didn't feel right. Sweat, swelling. They found a hernia. Girl. Well, Emily, what you have to do, so Emily's asking for advice on how to talk about this. You've got to tell him how it's interfering with your ability to function. You've got to tell him that, you know, anything that it's affecting, is it making uh, bowel movements painful? Is it making urination painful? Is sitting hard? Is driving hard? You've got to show him through your limited functionality how it's affecting your body. And then what you say is, how can we improve my functionality here? I need to be able to work. I need to be able to do stuff. And right now I can't because of this dang hernia. Hi, Debbie. Hey, Debbie, the best thing you can do is just email me, icnetwork at mac.com. Vicki says she likes Folgers Simply Smooth Decaf. Okay. Uh, Mubina says, any experience with Eurasist? Yeah, Eurasist has been around for about 20 years. Was used up in Canada fairly regularly. Uracist is liquid chondroitin is still directly into the bladder. Um, uh, and it was interesting in Canada, you had two competing bladder installations. You had cystostat, which was hyaluronic acid combined with uracist, which was with chondroitin. And they were just massively competing in research studies and all that sort of stuff. And I will tell you when they brought it down to the United States and started to do their preliminary research to get FDA approval. Both of those failed, which is why your assistance is to stat are not available in the United States. However, somebody in Europe did a remarkable thing. They combined the two into a single bladder installation called Iolaril. I -A, no, I -A -L -U -R -I -L. Iolaril is a combination of chondroitin and hyaluronic acid or sodium hyaluronate. And it's far superior than either one of those. So I think there's a chance that Iolaril might, might end up getting approved here in the United States if the company is willing to spend the money to do that. It's a lot of money to get approved. Hi, Boria. Barbie, I'm having a hard time understanding my IC. What does it mean if my pain is better after I do yoga? When I start working out, the pain and the urgency is actually better for a while. What that tells me is that, it's, that your symptoms are probably muscle driven. You, the fact that when you relax your muscles, your symptoms go away and you feel better. What that tells me is that you might be IC subtype three, pelvic floor driven. That is indeed the largest subtype. And these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of trauma, falling. 
uh, falling on your tailbone, a history of athletics, ice skating, things like that, where you fell a lot, gymnastics, ballet. For a man, if you're a paratrooper, if you're a wrestler, if you're a football player, that for many patients, the uh, bladder is a secondary victim of a fundamental injury trauma with the pelvic floor instead, the pelvic muscles. Emily says, they keep ignoring my lymph nodes. It's been three, it's been that way for three years now. Now I know I need to push for hon, if, if those lymph nodes are painful, um, yeah, you need you really need to talk about them. They might be, I mean, I'm assuming that it's been three years. There's there, I don't know if there would be some sort of underlying disease issue supporting that, but they might be able to do some lymphatic massage to try to empty it. Have you guys ever done that before? You know, like I get on this side right here. Well, like you can kind of see my lymph node right there. It's not really swollen, but I have a, I have a lymph node right here that pops out frequently. And I do um, lymphatic massage to just try to get it to drain. Google it, see what you think. Talk to your doctor about it. Melinda says, why does a hydrodistension work so well for some people and not for others? Because hun, a hydrodistension is what I call a destructive therapy. There's nothing constructive about a hydrodistension. When you stretch the bladder, you break the nerves. And when you break the nerves that control pain, frequency, urgency, that's why you feel better after a hydrodistension. But eventually the nerves are going to grow back and sometimes more nerves grow back than you originally had. And so hydrodistension is not a long-term viable therapy because therapy for 99.9% .9 of patients, because ultimately in the end, it's damaging. You're feeling better because it's destroying a nerve or damaging a nerve, but the nerves do grow back and that's why your symptoms come back. Vicky says, topical estrogen prescription, what kind do we use for estrogen atrophy? Estradiol. Estradiol is normally what they use, although for some patients, they might want to do a combination of estradiol and progesterone or estradiol and testosterone. That's a discussion you have to have with your gynecologist or your urologist. Ann Rush says she can't hear me. Y'all, everybody else can hear me though, right? Eileen on YouTube. Hello, Denise. Hello, Eileen. Eileen says, it's been a while since, feel since feeling great until I went off Allura to a cheaper brand. You guessed it. Back to the infections. Back on Allura, but this has left me with a urethral flare. Suggestions. Well, hon, remember that the urethra is kind of like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. And so I would have to wonder, number one, you've got some estrogen related dryness to your urethra, which might be why it's irritating so bad. Please come on over to our website and read the blog, the seven causes of urethral pain. The other thing I would want to know is, is there a chance that you've got an infection in your periurethral gland? And I talk about the, all about that in the blog. Uh, Allura, you guys, Allura is a paranthocyanidin product. It's based, it's from cranberry, but it's not as thick. You know, there are kind of two products that are over the counter that have been found to help prevent E. coli based infections, D-manos and or Elura. And I'm sorry, D-manos and or proanthocyanidins, also known as PACs. And it's the combination of the two that appear to be has the most recognition is called Allura. Allura is very expensive and quite a few people simply can't afford it. And so there is another one called Prevent uh, for people who can't afford the 120 for the Allura, but you might be able to afford the 60. Um, and so Prevent is something that we have in our store and it's made by the same company that makes natural approach nutrition. Denise said, I had a hypogastric plexus block this week, and in the past it was painful, but this time the doctor couldn't complete the procedure on the right side due to extreme pain. Ooh, weird. What did the doctor think was going on, Denise? Uh, Jen says, can I see patients progress from non-ulcerative to ulcerative? Uh, the answer is no, we just don't see that. We don't see that. And the biopsies explain why we don't see that. When you biopsy a Hunter's lesion, you see massive inflammation. There's biological war happening in the center of a Hunter's lesion. 
Um, and, you know, inflammation means your body's fighting something. So there's going to be a lot of white blood. Um, there's going to be a lot of leukocytes it's swarming the area to try to deal with whatever's happening there. And now we have a clue as to what might be causing Hunter's lesions in some patients, and that is viral infection. It was Europeans who first discovered active virus in the urine of patients with Hunter's lesions about six years ago. And in fact, what they found was Epstein-Barr, and they also found polyoma BK. And then the Americans and our own MAP Research Network from our National Institutes of Health did their own viral study. They too found active viral infection in a small subset of patients, maybe 10%, 5%. And they too found the polyoma virus, although they found a different virus, polyoma JC virus. And so, so that kind of stalls the argument that there's some progression here. I don't think I've ever worked with a patient who progressed from non-lesions to lesions in 28 years, and that kind of would explain why. So that's one theory behind that. Uh, now, listen, I got I got to hold you to task, though, because if you're drinking coffee every day and soda every day, not following the diet, and you happen to be IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven, and you're pouring acid on the wound every day, it's going to get bigger. It's going to get worse, you know? I think it's important that you think of this as injury illness. We don't really, the only illness we find in the subtyping system is Hunter's lesions, viral infection. Um, and it, for the bladder, in some cases, chronic fungal infection or chronic bacterial infection, but that's a really small group of patients. For the rest of us, it's really injury or trauma. And so your job is to create an environment that will support healing. If you had a wound on your hand and you poured coffee on it every day, what do you think is going to happen to the wound? It's going to get bigger. It's going to get bigger. It's going to get worse. It's going to get more painful. It's going to get swollen. It's going to turn bright red. You know, for our IC subtype 2 bladder wall treatment, remember we have three subvariants in that group. We've got chemical injury, estrogen atrophy, and chronic, chronic infections. So chemical injury. For some of you, I see begins, bladder wall symptoms begin because your diet was basically terrible. Drinking a massive amount of coffee, coffee, energy drinks, Mountain Dew, sodas, Diet Cokes, things like that. Your bladder was not designed for massive levels of acid. They didn't have massive levels of acid 5,000 years ago. We didn't have sodas 5,000 years ago. Today's diet is remarkably irritating. Valerie says, I drink decaf every day, no ill effects. Good. Vicki said, I lymph lymphatic massage for arm lymphedemia. It's so nice. Hello, Helen. Pamela says, send me to the gastro. Doctor, I have icy bladder, overactive bladder, pelvic floor, vulvodynia. Over a year now with mouth swollen and gums. Doc nothing has worked. Dentist said gingivitis. Had two doctor's appointments. They want, want to, won't get near me to look at my mouth. So they sent me to a gastro. You're having an MRI on pancreas. You have a mass in your pancreas. Could be stomach issues. Getting the run around for 18 years. Yes, I took that and was losing my eyesight. Oh, honey. Yeah, got to have that MRI. Let's try to check that out. You know, by the way, guys. Okay, so this is the perfect opportunity uh, to number one, introduce myself. Hello, Jill Osborne, president of the IC Network, longer service IC support group leader in the United States. And now I think it's pretty fair to say probably in the world. Uh, I bring to you three college degrees, a chemistry degree, a drug development pharmacology degree with a surgical internship, and then a degree in psychology. The IC Network was my doctoral dissertation proposal for a PhD in psychology, which ironically I could not get because of my IC. Uh, I am also a presidential fellow for my work in graduate school. Um, um, normally when I do these meetings, I do a 30 minute lecture and then I take your questions and then we go to Zoom. I didn't really have a lecture prepared for today. However, I do have something very exciting to share with you today. And that is, it is official. We can now talk about this brand new book um, that was produced um, by Massachusetts General uh, Hospital. It's called Facing Pelvic Pain, A Guide for Patients and Their Families, Harvard University. And what they did two years ago is Invited leading experts in pelvic pain to um, offer a chapter. And I was stunned that they asked me. So I am now published by 
Harvard Medical School. I'm really, really thrilled. My chapter in this is on how to find support. But here's why this book is so important. And it goes right back to Pamela here. You know, you have to understand that interstitial cystitis is a grab bag diagnosis. A lot of different types of patients are diagnosed with IC, and yet you're not the same. For some of you, symptoms begin in childhood. For other symptoms begin after menopause. For some of you, symptoms begin uh, after having a baby, while for others, symptoms begin after you fall. For some of you, symptoms might begin after a history of being abused. While for others, it's just random. It just appears suddenly and you have no freaking clue what the issue is. But when we look at the bladder, the harsh reality is for many of us, myself included, we have a normal bladder. And it's very baffling. I mean, you're at the doctor, you're bawling your eyes out. Please help me. Please help me. This is agonizing. I can't sleep. I'm The doctor goes, well, I don't know. Your bladder's fine. And they send you on your way. And you're like, and they kind of give you that awful look like it's all in your head. Maybe it's all in your head. Maybe like I had a friend of mine say to me, she said, and she's no longer a friend. She's, I see her once every 10 years, but I used to see her every day. She said, Jill, I just think you like being in pain. I think you need therapy. I could not have been more offended. I could not have been more offended. And of course, with subtyping, now we know what my subtype is. I'm IC subtype 5, central sensitization combined with IC subtype 3. All right. So here's why this book is a game changer. Is because it talks about all of the other conditions that can cause bladder symptoms. And so, for example, um, uh, chapter 3 is... Which gynecological symptoms can lead to pelvic pain? And obviously we know fibroid tumors, endometriosis, things like that, right? Okay, so that makes sense. Remember, for many of you, your bladder is a victim of another dysfunction in your pelvis, right? Another, the next chapter is which male urological problems can lead to pelvic pain, you know, from chronic prostatitis, etc. The next chapter is um, uh, a common urogenital issues between sexes. Like for example, we had somebody in our meeting last week who had a urethral caruncle and a urethral caruncle is a little flap of tissue at the end of the urethra that can become very, very painful. Um, one of the more interesting cases uh, of IC patients that I've worked with was a woman who had severe pain Bladder therapies didn't work for her. Nothing worked for her. She goes from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor. And she kept saying, my pain is by my urethra. And finally, she got a, a nurse practitioner who really listened to her. And the a nurse practitioner said, you know what? Let's do a CAT scan or a, a whatever test. It was either an MRI or a CAT. And you know what they found? Is she had a urethral diverticulum. So your urethra is like the size of your little finger, right? Whoops, whoops, hold on a sec. I just messed up my... Okay, so your urethra is the size of your finger. She had a tube, the length of her urethra coming off of her urethra neck to it. So there was a little tiny tube connecting her urethra with a urethral diverticulum. And it probably happened because of straining of some type. That's why you never strain to pee or to have a bowel movement, there are consequences to that. And so what was happening with this urethral diverticulum is it was filling with urine, but she couldn't empty it. And it was getting infected. And once they saw the diverticulum and they removed it surgically, what do you think happened, my friends? No more IC, right? No more IC. So again, if you're not responding to therapy, man, we got to take a step back and consider some other stuff. Um, chapter six... Here, hold on a sec. I love chapter six. What gastrointestinal problems can lead to pelvic pain, right? I mean, IBS, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I mean, listen, I have no shame. I have no shame. I will talk about anything. Y'all know intimate personal details about me. Um, I struggle with consistently far more than bladder pain is, is rectal sensitivity. 
I call it rectodynia. That's not a real diagnosis. That's what I call it. And it's funny. A lot of you have this because I've talked to you about it. I see subtype five central sensitization that rectal sensitivity is real. And um, the crazy thing is that because I was not eating enough fiber, I was passing stools and that was irritating this little, 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 tiny, tiny hemorrhoid I had inside, an internal hemorrhoid. And it's like, God, it hurts bad. How can it possibly be a hemorrhoid? And she goes, it's your hemorrhoid. Yeah. And I got a whole less on fiber, which actually really worked. Okay. Uh, chapter seven, huge. Which musculoskeletal problems can lead to pelvic pain? Now, we had a research study come out this summer, last summer, that showed that 70% of the men with testicular pain had an underlying hip abnormality. It was coming from a joint, their hip. And so when we look at those patients who have normal bladders, we want to absolutely study their, the orthopedics to the pelvis. What's going on with their muscles? What's going on with their joints? Is their hip normal? Is their SI joint normal? Is their knee joint normal? Are their feet normal? And we have a fabulous book, whole, whole uh, game-changing book for people with pelvic injuries and muscle issues called Breaking Through Chronic Pain that is free on Kindle Unlimited. No excuses. We also have it in our store if you like to highlight stuff like I do. But this is a book for people with musculoskeletal injury, right? It's a master class in pelvic anatomy. Obviously, this is just a small chapter, but you do have to understand that orthopedics matter. Here you go. Here's another chapter. What types of bone and ligament problems can lead to pelvic pain? And fundamentally for me with my SI joint, it is a ligament issue. Um, here you go. What are rheumatological neuroinflammatory, neuroinflammatory and vascular pain, right? So when you have tight, mus tight muscles, one of the things that it does is it restricts blood flow. And when you restrict blood flow, you get oxygen deprivation of tissues, also known as ischemia. And so for many of you, part of your symptoms are because you suffered an original pelvic floor injury. Your muscles have been tight for years, if not decades, and you have chronic ischemia in your bladder. And it's very hard for your bladder and your other tissues to be healthy if they don't have good blood supply. Our therapeutic priority for those patients is to restore blood supply. And then it's got some great chapters on how to diet, how physical therapy and diet and exercise affect pelvic pain. Um, how can pelvic pain be affected by, well, how is pelvic pain different in children and adolescents? How, when is surgery considered? What are minim, minimally invasive interventions, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes through a whole thing on, men, on uh, medications. So here's the deal, my friends. It's free on Kindle Unlimited. It's freaking free on Kindle Unlimited. No excuses. If you're not getting better on bladder therapies, you have a bladder, a healthy bladder wall, please get this book and go through those chapters because you might be missing something completely normal and fixable, like pelvic congestion syndrome. If Do you feel like you're carrying a bowling ball around in your pelvis every day? And as the, as the day goes on, it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier pelvic congestion syndrome. It means you have varicose veins in your pelvis. That's fixable easily, but you have to see a specific type of radiologist called an interventional radiologist that had done correctly. So I want you to be, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. We have to study your body. We can have a good discussion about treatments until we understand your anatomy. And for many of you, you are guessing you have frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. You think it's infection for years. It's not infection for some of you. For most of you, it's not infection. It could be fibroid tumors pushing on your bladder. It could be endometriosis attached to your bladder. It could be a musculoskeletal problem that's compromising your bladder. It could be a tarlof cyst coming off of your spine, right? And so there's great hope. Now, you know, 
One of the tragedies in the IC world that we're now rectifying is many of you have taken Elmer on for years because there was nothing else. I, I talked with one lady who, I kid you not, her entire life savings over 25 years went into paying for Elmer on, which is very expensive. And she'd run out of money. She called me and said, what do I do? And I said, well, did the Elmer on help? And she goes, no, never. And I said, well, why did you keep taking it? And she said, because there's nothing else available. We can't say that anymore. Look at that shelf back there. We have a ton of supplements that were created by IC researchers that are available. You know, but, you know, more importantly, we now understand the physical reality for the majority of patients, in my opinion, our symptoms are being driven by muscle dysfunction. Go back to when your symptoms began, doesn't matter how old you were. Think about trauma. Did you fall? Did you have a baby? Were you abused? Were you an athlete? Were you that kid who was um, re recreating Tom Cruise sliding on his socks across a wooden floor and you fell on your tailbone and then butt first down to stairway, stairwell? That's, that has happened many times. You'd be amazed the number of patients I work with that that's happened to. His symptoms, bam, within hours of doing that because he took multiple traumatic pelvic floor Pudendal, uh, pudendal nerve tailbone injuries. So these happen. All right. It's free. Seriously, it's free on Kindle Unlimited. Go sign up if you've got, if you can do Kindle on your computer. I'm watching me on computer right now. You can get the Kindle app and you can just go to Amazon, sign up for Kindle Unlimited for a month. It's free. Download the book, read it. No excuses. I mean, we're, we're getting so good at this now. We're curing people now. Instead of putting people on Elmeron for decades, which is leading to blindness for some of you. Denise says, can the overuse of antibiotics cause porous teeth, uh, tooth breakage? I don't know, hon. Uh, I, do remember I do remember reading something about... Uh, anticholinergic medications, antidepressants causing uh, dry mouth over time that, you know, uh, that ended up um, creating a really bad environment for tooth health. And so they always, if you're taking a medication which dries you out, they always want you to be using dry mouth products like biotin, or I do, um, I, I suck on little xylitol um, candies. They're not candy, it's for dry mouth. Because I get dry mouth too, and I'm not even taking anything. I have Sika, also known as uh, a variant of Sjogren's syndrome, which is dry mouth, dry eyes. Sylvian says, I started taking Sister Protec. Is it a good treatment to replace Elmeron? Yes, it, it is absolutely what many patients switch to. People have been getting off of Elmeron for years. Why? Because it's expensive. Um, and many people simply couldn't afford it. And so they absolutely started transitioning to chondroitin-based supplements, which are believed to have the same bladder coating effect. And Sister Protect was the first chondroitin-based supplement, been around for over 20 years. We have, certainly we've got su newer supplements than that that do more than Sister Protect does, but that's definitely a viable option. Um, Sister Protect is on your manufacturer's delay now. It's uh, delayed until um, April. Uh, April. Uh, and so if uh, we don't have the sister of ProTech and we're down to our last couple of bottles, if you want to get it, because I won't have it for three months. Um, the, um, the next closest option is going to be Sisto Mend. So this is Sisto created by IC, federally funded IC researcher, Dr. Theo Harris, Theo Harides at Tufts University. Um, and um, again, this was a game changer when this came out. You know, IC patients absolutely loved it. In, in fact, I still remember the first patient who called me after trying Sister Protec was stunned at how much it helped her arthritis in her spine, in her lower spine. She was baffled by that. Um, but Cistro Protect, again, top dog for years until two years ago when they uh, 
had to put a cancer warning on the label for an ingredient called titanium dioxide. That's now gone, but we didn't have Sister Protec for a good portion of a year. So Sister Protec is back. It doesn't contain titanium dioxide. It's available. It's, vi it's a viable option. It's just not available right now. But Sistomand is. So Sistomand, same ingredients with the addition of pumpkin seed extract, and it's $5 cheaper. Um, and so this is what we're suggesting that patients do. You know, Sister Protec has just had issues, issues from the cancer warning to unpredictable un uh, manufacturer's delays. It was very important that we have something to back it, those patients. And so Sisto Mend is made by the same company that makes the now top supplement in the IC world called Bladder Builder. And the reason why Bladder Builder is a top supplement is not only does it have chondroitin for, to protect the bladder wall as well, where, as well as other things, it also has a pain reducing ingredient called PEA. So we just did our one year follow up study with this. 60% of the patients who tried Bladder Builder still take it today. They report fewer flares, less fl um, shorter flares, less painful flares, and 25% of them are now pain free. But 40% stopped using Bladder Builder because number one, they couldn't afford it. And it's, it's like $46 uh, for a month. Um, they, their doctor wanted them to do something else or they had a side effect. And all of the chondroitin-based supplements run the risk of causing some gut distress uh, and stomach upset. And so um, you know, we always say to patients, start slow, try one capsule, see how you do. I used to take Sister Protect. <clears throat> and what was interesting is I could take one pill and it was not a problem at all. It felt like warm cotton candy in my bladder. Uh, if I went to two pills, it gave me a loose bowel. And if I went to three pills, it gave me diarrhea. And so for me, because I'm so sensitive, which makes sense, I see subtype five, central sensitization. When I take supplements, I, I take one. I don't take the full dose. Uh, Lisa says, is Thorn Uristatin a good product for IC? I've never heard of it. Let's look it up. Thorn Uristatin. Let's see what it is. A unique formula that supports urinary tract health. Well, let's look at it. A uristatin soothes the bladder and other urinary tract issues. It helps maintain a healthy balance of microorganisms. Oh no, hun! It does no. There, there's really nothing in this that we we would consider beneficial for the typical, say, estrogen atrophy patient. It doesn't have chondroitin in it. I mean, the most important ingredient right now really is going to be chondroitin for the bladder coating effect. Uh, Maria says, I see a recurrent UTI connection. Uh, usually the connection is estrogen atrophy. Gosh, man, I'm talking fast and a lot right now. Anne says, does a hydrodistension diagnose IC? No, it does not. Hydrodistensions at this point in time are only done if the diagnosis is in doubt for a closer look at the bladder and to identify potential um, uh, Hunter's lesions. And also glomerulations, petechial hemorrhages are also thrown out because we now know the hydrodistension causes those. Judy says, should you take D-mannose when you're having a flare? No, all D-mannose does is it, it inhibits the ability of E. coli to attach to the bladder wall. It will do absolutely nothing for a diet flare if you've drunk coffee or if you've got est estrogen atrophy in that respect, it will not soothe the bladder wall at all. Save your money. Jay Charity says, I have Hunter's IC. I cannot seem to come out of this flare. I had surgery on January 19th and was not, was not told that this was a flare or anything of substance. I'm having pain that ranges from one to six every day, but I cannot figure out. Coffee doesn't bother me, but a vegan pizza did. Girl, if you have Hunter's lesions, you should not be drinking coffee, period. Even if you think it doesn't bother you, you should not be drinking coffee with Hunter's lesions. You've got big wounds in your bladder. And what would happen if you poured a wound in your bladder every day? You're just going to make it worse. Even if you don't feel it, 
You have to create an environment that will calm and soothe that. Drinking coffee with Hunter's Legions is a mistake, hands down, total mistake. But a vegan pizza did, so it could be the tomato sauce on the pizza. Hopefully they treated your lesions, hon. Did they, did they treat them? I mean, lesions are treated with uh, heat. They can cauterize them. They can laser them. They can inject them with a steroid. And normally when you treat the lesion correctly with a lesion-specific therapy, the pain goes away. Uh, Becky says, I had two regular cystoscopies and they never did a hydrodescension. Is this a problem? I was told cystoscopy can show, show hunters. It depends on the skill of the doctor. A lot of doctors really don't know how to identify Hunter's lesions correctly. Um, we just had a new identification guide um, that published a couple of months ago for doctors so that they can look at the different ways that Hunter's lesions present themselves because sometimes they're like cracks rather than being around. Um, there is one type of cystoscopy that will show Hunter's lesions. It's called a narrow band imaging narrow band imaging. So if your doctor has a narrow band imaging available, then yes, they would be able to see Hunter's lesions. I know, you know, I have a hydrodistension until three years ago. My doctor knew I had, he said, there's no, I've had, I had had two cystoscopies. Um, I done void diaries, flare diaries. He said, Jill, I'm not going to put you through a high. I know exactly what you have. There's no reason to traumatize you further. And I'm very grateful for that. But if you are going to have your distension, make sure, number one, that they take pictures. You want them to give you pictures of what your bladder looks like or video so that you can put those in your record files so that you can show them to any other doctors that you might see. And so having a picture of your lesions or, or whatever they see in your bladder is really, really important. You also should have a discussion about what they intend to do if they find lesions. You know, okay, doc, if you find lesions, what are you gonna do about it? If they say nothing, you're gonna say, why not? Lesions should be treated. And if they say they don't have the equipment, then you're gonna ask for a referral for to somebody who does have the equipment. Hello, Diana from Puerto Rico. So nice to see you, hon. I hope things are going well. Man, I really hope we can make Puerto Rico a state soon. I really do. You guys do not get the representation you deserve in our government, but a statehood would certainly give that. Not to be political, but there you go. Vicky says, please don't think this is strange. I've had IC for almost three years now, but I can be having an okay. And then when I listen to our support group, I start hurting. One of my sub to subtype five. You know, um, so I attended... Uh, okay. So, you know, I, I've talked about this before. Last October, we had a fabulous international pelvic pain conference and uh, through, for most of the month. And it was so good. I mean, I've given many, many talks on that. And they talked about something I'd never heard about before. And that is that when a doctor lists describing their symptoms and describing comfort and describing their life, their, the doctor's brain starts to mimic what's happening in the patient's brain. And it was like sympathetic something, something. I don't remember the exact name, but, but that's probably what's happening here. I mean, I, I have that too. I mean, when I work with somebody, even though I'm symptom free, the great majority of the time, um, uh, if I'm working with somebody who is really struggling, I embody that. I take it in. It, you know, there's some empathy. Situational empathy might be the word that they used in that class. Um, um, you have to have good defenses. You have to have good defenses. And if you're in a low point <clears throat> where you're not strong, the last place you want to come is on the Internet. You know, you want to separate. You want to calm and nourish your spirit and your soul until you're feeling a little bit stronger. Because remember, support groups are always going to be biased towards people who are struggling. But for every patient on today having a bad day, there are thousands having great days that don't need to be here. So you also have to keep it in the context, right? 
There are thousands of patients right now with IC who are doing just fine. They're having a great day. They're not going to come to these meetings and share their success story. They're out living their life. That's what we want them to do. So support group meetings are always going to be biased towards people who are struggling. You've got to remember that context here. Pamela says, my hip ki kills me. X-ray says nothing. I need that book. Yeah, Pamela, you do. Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, I think, would be a great book for you to do. Um, and yes, you have, you've been carrying a bowling ball around for years. And so it would be very interesting to ask your gynecologist to think you might, you might have varicose veins. And if they, if you do, they send you to an interventional radiologist to check that out. Hello, David. It's so nice to see you. Cindy says, do you think bladder builder and sister protect are better than aloe vera? They have completely different methods of action. Aloe vera is calming and soothing, calming and soothing. You know, aloe vera on a sunburn feels good, um, but it's not, no, none, nothing is going to heal your bladder. The only thing that's going to heal your bladder is your bladder. <clears throat> when you're taking a supplement or a treatment, we're trying to deal with symptoms as well as create an environment that would support healing. And so this is where coating is helpful because if you protect the bladder wall while it's healing, you're giving your bladder wall an opportunity to potentially fix it, right? And so, you know, aloe vera is, it's been around for years. Um, there are two primary aloe products. You've got the products from Desert Harvest Aloe. They've been around. And then we also have a new product called Aloe Path, which combines aloe with PEA. And that's the one I'm really excited about because that's the one that has a pain, pain fire ingredient in it too. But understand that quite a few people have challenges with aloe. You know, I mean, if you're sensitive to aloe, you, it might give you gut stress, things like that. And it, it's, it's surprisingly common. And so whenever I'm talking with patients about treatment options, I always say, have you ever tried aloe? And if they say yes, they, how did you do? And if they say not well, then we don't even look at the aloe product right to the chondroitin product. So I put the chondroitin products first. Why, um, why am I so strong about that now? Because uh, last year, a year ago, the European Society for the Study of IC released a new study in which they found that chondroitin Chondroitin was the most effective at, at restoring the superficial integrity of the bladder wall. That was in that that was when they were comparing bladder installations, chondroitin, hyaluronic acid or hyaluronic heparin, etc. In that study, it was the chondroitin that was the most successful. Now, of course, with supplements, you've got digestion. <clears throat> That's with Elmeron, you have digestion. Just digestion will will destroy a good portion of the supplement. And so we always wanna hope that some of that supplement makes it to the bladder to provide some beneficial effect. We call that bioavailability. With Elmeron, bioavailability was very, very poor. 92% uh, uh, or more of Elmeron was destroyed by digestion. That was, public, that was from their own research study. They published that data, which really surprised me. And that's why you had to take a lot of Elmeron over time for it to build up into your bladder to be somewhat helpful. And of course, that's now the foundation for so many of these retinal eye issues. Um, we don't have the same bioavail bioavailability study with chondroitin-based products. Um, and so what we have to do instead is we've got to kind of extrapolate from the research we do have. And so in my opinion, I think it's the chondroitin that is the most important if you are IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven, especially if you have estrogen atrophy. But again, guys, I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. My job is to empower you, educate you, and kick you in the butt and get you back to your doctor and ask some questions, right? Diana, I have the book Breaking Through Chronic pain, Pelvic Pain, and it is amazing. I'm learning a lot about my body and how muscles and nerves are affected. I recommend it. Diane, Diana, thank you. It is just a game changer. That book, this book, for those of us with muscle issues and orthopedic issues, absolute game changer. It is a master class. It is so good. I've read it twice now. You know, and you can see, you can see that for me to to for to learn things, I do a lot of highlighting, et cetera, et cetera. 
one of the things that he talks about in this book uh, is something called Proctalgia Fugax. Proctalgia Fugax. Proctalgia Fugax is a sudden onset of severe rectal pain that will last for a couple of minutes, like five minutes, and then it just goes away. And as somebody who has had a significant amount of rectal pain, including moments like that, um, um, I thought that was a fascinating discussion at the end of the book. And again, it kind of comes down to muscles and nerves. Um, but it's always nice to know that, that they're studying it and they're looking at this. So Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain is just a stunningly good book. Cindy says, I take Systomand after taking Systoprotect for, for 10 years. Systomand works great. Cindy, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy with the company and they work with me very, very closely. Um, and I get notified if there are delays and all sorts of stuff like that. And I can't say that about Sister Protect right now. I'm working with the Sister Protect product manager, but, you know, and I talk with him fairly regularly too. He's a wonderful guy. So nice to have a product manager, but this was not his mistake. This was a mistake of the distributor not telling the company they had run out. They didn't order it in time. That's why we have a manufacturing delay. Lisa says, how do you find out if you have estrogen atrophy? It's really quick. It's really easy. Are you dry? Are you dry? Uh, do you have burning on your vulva as you're peeing? Uh, if you do, that means your skin is dry. Uh, we call that, um, I call that urine burn. And that is one of the first symptoms of estrogen atrophy. Ultimately, go to your doctor and have them look. It's really easy to identify estrogen atrophy. At the, the skin changes and the skin becomes very thin, but it also gets lines in it. I, I've never seen the lines, but they've told me it gets lines in it that they can see in your vagina. Sharon says, I had my hunter's lesion surgically treated, cauterized, my bladder split during the procedure. What is the, oh girl, you're not the only one that's happened to. Uh, I'm on an all natural OTC treatments and icy diet now, but have pain often. I use marshmallow root and pre-leaf a lot. Yoga, meditation, need to research more on viral infections. New info for me. Thank you. You know, your, yeah, your challenge here. I'm, I got, I'd love to share and I'd talk to you this week and, you know, next week at some point in time and hear more about that. Um, uh, I have one other patient whose bladder split, but the reason it split was because they left a bleeder during a surgery and his bladder filled up with blood clots. So many blood clots that literally it was an emergency surgery. And as they were opening him up, his bladder kind of exploded. It was just filled with blood clots. And they had, it, it just, it just kind of popped open in two pieces and they just got out all the blood clots and stitched it back together. And he's, he's, he's doing okay. Marshmallow root bothers some people, so don't put out, don't put all of your thing in marshmallow root. Um, I think Sharon, what would be fascinating for, would be for you to have a next generation urine test, uh, specifically for fungus, for bacteria, but most importantly for viruses. It'd be really interesting to see if you can identify a virus in your urine. Um, so there are a couple of different companies that do next generation tests. Uh, you can go to bladderhealth.org, which is a website I built on this a couple of years ago. Um, and, um, uh, Microgen is the company that we've worked with, but you have to order a separate viral test with them. There's another company, Pathnostics, and then there's even another company that do the viral screens automatically that Microgen does not do. Linda says, what are my thoughts on marshmallow? It bothers about 50% of the people who try it. Uh, says, what is the product you recommend instead of aloe vera? Allopath. Show you. Allopath. It's the same organic anthraquinone free aloe base, but it has the addition of PEA, palmitoethanolamide, for pain relief. And we've talked about that before. PEA has been used in Europe for decades. It's been studied, extensive research studies on a variety of chronic pain conditions. 
uh, like fibromyalgia, sciatica, burning mouth syndrome. Uh, and uh, two years ago at the American Urology Association, the Italian brought an ICPEA research study to the table, which gave us remarkable results that, uh, let's see, um, 25%, let's see, at three months, 87% of IC patients using PEA showed a significant reduction in their pain. At six months, 25% of those patients were now pain-free and the rest were, do, were doing remarkably well. And so, uh, and well, very, very well tolerated. No, it, I went through about 30 studies trying to understand this a little bit more and only one study showed side effects. The rest showed that PEA was remarkably uh, um, gentle. Uh, and so we do have uh, just a PEA formula. And this is what I take if I start feeling, uh, feeling nerve pain. I take Peora, P-E-A-O-R-A. Why? Because my bladder was healthy. Although I, I'm getting into the estrogen atrophy now, so I might have to go back to a chondroitin-based supplement. But for my nerve pain, uh, rectal pain, pins and needles, things like that. It's all about the PEA. And that was kind of the consensus among the research researchers working with PEA was that it was the best at dealing with nerve driven neuropathic pain. Mark Hess says, what do I think of d for the prevention of UTIs? Well, I mean, it's a shot. Um, it's not as effective as proanthocyanidins and as PACs, PACs. Um, uh, the human body does not use mannose. Uh, it's a sugar that is immediately passed through into our urine, and uh, it it mirrors a receptor on the uh, on the E. coli bacteria and the bladder wall. So what will happen is the bacteria will attach to the D mannose molecule rather than the bladder wall, and then you end up peeing it out. So it's a viable option, um, and prevent. Uh, I think both Prevent and Elura, which are over-the-counter products, combine the two, PACs and D-Manos. Um, so this is Prevent, Prevent. You can, and this is probably, so Natural Approach Nutrition, who makes Bladder Builder and Bladder Rest, they were asked by a top IC researcher to create a more affordable option for Allura. And this right now is their best-selling product by far. Um, so Prevent is doing very, very well. But everybody's different. Everybody's different. All right, guys. So listen, it's 2 o'clock. So what does this mean? This means that it is time for the Zoom meeting. So I'm going to activate Zoom. And for those of you who want to come in, uh, you can talk to me directly. We're going to leave Facebook up. We're going to leave YouTube up. You guys are going to hear this. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to ask questions and to get a little bit of what we call wellness coaching from me. If y'all want to do it, that's fine. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Daytona 500's on. I, I'll go sit with my dad for a while, who's 98 years old. But if you want to do it, Let's do it. So let me start that up. The way to get to the Zoom meeting is if you go to our website, icnetwork.org, which I'm going to do right now, icnetwork.org. And when you get to the front page of our website, go to the support pull down menu, which is right underneath the logo, and go to the second link, streamed support group meetings. And let's see here. And then in the stream support group meetings, you will see the link right into, it's right underneath. I've got the Facebook link, the YouTube channel and the Zoom meeting. So let's go ahead and start that up. All righty. Zoom says I'm using computer audio rather than, hmm, that's interesting. I don't know why. All righty. So, oh, look at this. My hair is all over the place. Okay. Let me get you the invitation. Invitation in 
Facebook and YouTube. And listen, you guys, especially on Facebook, please know that it moves by so quickly. I might have missed your question. Don't take it personally. Just ask your question again. Hello, YouTube. Look at all you people over here. Oh, and by the way, I'm using a brand new, much faster internet connection. Uh, this is our first test. Uh, pretty expensive. It's five times the amount, five times the cost of our other one. But I'm hoping that it will improve our video quality. Uh, Emma says, I tried to join the IC network, but in the United Kingdom, it appears you shipped to Scotland and Ireland, but not England. Right now, we cannot ship to England because of Brexit. Uh, the United Kingdom government informed us that we would have to accept, we would have to charge you VAT tax. And uh, right now we can't do that. And so, Emma, if you have a friend in Scotland, Ireland, uh, the United States that we can ship it to, and then they can ship it to you as a gift, that's the workaround. But we've got to file all new paperwork with the British government to collect VA tax, and then we've got to figure out how to pay it. And that's hard. It's it's hard. So I'm so, but you can do, you can do a membership for $25 and get our stuff by email. And then we don't have to worry about VAT, but VAT uh, for goods is a whole nother story. All right. So YouTube, you, you guys have the link. Facebook, you have the link. I get, let's give it five minutes or three minutes. Let's see if anybody wants to do this. Ruth says, uh, I'm in the United Kingdom. What's the best thing for flares? Ruth, it depends upon what kind of flare you have, hun. If you're having a bladder wall flare from eating or drinking something you shouldn't have, then we're going to, number one, dilute the urine. Number two, maybe alkalinize the urine with a Tums, a pre-leaf, maybe a quarter teaspoon of baking soda and a glass of water. Uh, maybe use some azo bladder pain relief tablets. I don't know if you have that in the United Kingdom. It is the over-the-counter version of pyridium, the stuff that turns your urine orange. And then, girl, you got to write it out. If it's an intense flare, you call the doctor to see if you can have a rescue installation. If it's a pelvic floor flare from sex, you're taking a long car ride. What we're going to be doing instead is focusing on relaxing muscles. How do we do that? We're going to do that uh, with heat. Um, and so let's get a hot shower, hot bath using a heating pad. Um, uh, maybe a muscle relaxant like baclofen or flexoril, maybe doing the stretches that your doc that your physical therapist told you to do when you're having flares. That's general. So we have to truly really try to understand, Ruth, the type of flare you're having. Ruth says, is it bad to take pre-leaf continuously? You need to follow the manufacturer's instruction. Pre-leaf is calcium. If you take too much pre-leaf, you're going to end up with calcium in your, a lot of calcium in your bloodstream. You don't eat it like candy. You don't take 20 a day. You take one or two before a meal. That's safe. But if you eat in a, dozens of them a day, you could start throwing kidney stones, and that's very painful. We don't want to do that. All right. Hello, Boria. Hello, Maria. Let's just give it one more minute. Uh, let me post the invite again into Facebook if y'all want to Zoom. Anybody have any questions about Valentine's intimacy chocolate? Hey, by the way, I just wrote a, uh, so I have, you know, we have several IC websites. The website that I love, love is called the IC Diet Project, icdietproject.com. It is an archive of the best recipes. It's a beautiful website. It was, we did a, um, it, kind of an interesting story. We almost lost pre-leaf. The company almost canceled pre-leaf years ago. Um, they also made Beano and, and other major products, Cat Sip, and, and pre-leaf was not a big moneymaker for them. And they just didn't invest in it at all. And so Alan Pligerman, the guy who invented it, uh, was talking to me one day and he said he, they were almost to the point where they're just going to stop making it. And I said, um, please let me do a marketing campaign for you. And I did. And that was the foundation for IC Diet Project. And it saved the brand. He called me like three months later. He goes, I don't know what the hell you're doing, 
but you've just saved this brand. We're, it's now selling again. And so now it's still sponsored by Preleaf, but gosh, we have a lot of fun with it. And it features recipes by me, by uh, Julie Beyer, uh, the first registered dietitian who worked with IC and the author of Confident Choices, a cookbook for IC and Confident Choices, uh, Customizing the IC Diet, two excellent, excellent books on the diet. And then also Bev Lamb, the author of A Taste of the Good Life. And her book has been out for over 20 years. It's not for sale anymore. But Bev Lamb, it was absolutely stunningly smart woman. Um, and uh, just thrilled. I, I'm good friends with both of them. And we've collaborated on a lot of diet project stuff over the years. So if you're looking for new recipes, icdietproject.com. Just did a big article yesterday. Oh, not a big article, but it was uh, on uh, for people who react to chocolate. I can't eat chocolate. I haven't even eaten chocolate in 25 years. It gives me terrible bowel spasms. 30 years, actually. 30, 35 years, actually. Um, and there's a reason why. Because uh, chocolate has, I think, tyramine in it, uh, which is known for triggering a wide variety of issues as well as caffeine. But you know what we can do? We can do, we can do white chocolate. But carob is to die for. The carob that they make today is stunning. It's so good. There's no caffeine and there's no tyrosine in it, which can trigger migraines. And so um, I put a recipe in there for carob brownies as well as some carob hot drinks for those of you who miss hot chocolate. And, you know, with the polar vortex right now, a lot of you are really cold, but you can't do hot chocolate, but guess what? You can do hot carob drinks and they're really, really good. So go over and check icdietproject.com. All right, let us start. Okay, so I've got uh, four people in Zoom. Let's go ahead. Now guys with Zoom, don't take it personally if I don't call you soon. I try to do it based upon the order that y'all come in. And so I'm going to go to Boria first. Hello, Boria. Are you there? Let me turn up the volume on this things. Hi, Bor. Yep. Hey, girl. How are you today? Okay. Okay. Well, what can I help you with? Nothing really. Okay. Any questions that you might have? Or are you just listening? Uh, just have a very bad bladder. You have a very bad bladder. Okay. How long has this been going on? Is it just in the last year? Or has it been going for a lot of years? A lot of years. Okay. How old are you? 62. 62? 62? Yep. Okay. And so how old were you when it started? 27. Really? Okay. So that immediately kind of opens up a new door for us. Um, had you, before it started, had a hysterectomy or anything like that? No. Okay. Had you had cancer? Had you gone through chemotherapy? No. Okay. Were you a big diet soda drinker or soda drinker? Uh, yes. Okay. Has anybody looked in your, has a doctor looked in your bladder? Yes. And, yes. and what did they find when they, what did they see when they looked in your bladder? They found Hunter's lesions. Okay. So they found Hunter's lesions. Okay. Um, and, um, did you ever have mononucleosis? No. Okay. How about Epstein-Barr? Ep well, Epstein-Barr is mono. All right. So did you have, did you have Epstein-Barr at one point in time? Yes, I did. Okay. And so that's one of the viruses that they have found in the urine of patients with IC. I, I mean, patients with Hunter's lesions. Did they treat the Hunter's lesions? Uh, they put DMSO in. That's not a treatment for a Hunter's lesion. We we'll do nothing no. for Hunter's lesions. Um, what they did. They went in there and uh, they went in and scraped them off or burned them. Okay. okay. And did your symptoms get better when they did that? Actually, they got worse. Now they're better. Okay, well, that makes sense because, you know, a hunter's lesion is basically a big wound, right? And if you scrape, right, if yeah. you scrape a wound, it's going to hurt, right? And so, right. so the good news now is that healing is always happening. You're living proof of that. They treated it and you have gotten better. But are you still, are you still struggling with pain? Yes. 
Okay. Has the pain gotten better or worse in the last five years? Worse. Okay. So the other issue that has to be playing a role now is aging. Estrogen right. atrophy. You're 62. Right. Your skin is drier. So tell us about the pain. Is the pain, where is the pain located? Is it in the bladder? Okay. Is it in the urethra too, or just in the bladder? Urethra. Say that again. Urethra. Okay. So the urethra is kind of like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. And so it's the urethra that's often the first part of the urinary tract that will start screaming, help me, help me, help me when your skin gets dry. So it would be very useful and important for you to go to your gynecologist and have them look at your skin down there. Because if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra and so is your bladder. And so the great news is that with a little bit of topical estrogen, that discomfort will usually improve. Okay. 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 Now the second thing, sorry, my lips get really dry when I do these. Um, the second thing that we have to look at and consider is the fact that because you have been in pain over time, your body reacts to pain by making muscles tight. That's right. called the guarding reflex. And so let me ask you this. When you go to pain, can you start your stream right away or do you hesitate? 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds before you can release I urine. Hesitate. Okay. So that's the second thing we want to look at is do you now have pelvic floor dysfunction because of the pain? And the answer is I, you, I'm sure because, because you can't turn that off. That's the way our body's wired. So, so you, so you've got a couple of pieces of homework here. Number one, when you go to the gynecologist, have them look at your skin. And if you're dry, a, a, a simple topical estrogen, normally what they will do is they will, yeah, estrays, they will have you rub like a pea sized drop into the entrance of, of your urethra to try okay. to try to give your urethra a little jump start. Call your doctor, send your or send an email to your doctor, make sure that's okay with your doctor. But okay. that's what they had me do. And it worked beautifully. My urethra that would. Yeah. Right. And it took about two weeks of using estrogen cream for that to go away. And if I forget to do it, it comes right back. Okay. Okay. Now, the second thing we want your, your, your gynecologist to look at is your muscles. You need to be clear and say, listen, I can't start my urine stream right away. Can you please check my muscles to see if they're tight? And if they are, then ask for a referral to a pelvic floor physical therapist. So it may be that your hunter's lesions are, have healed. They and actually have terazosin. Say that again. Terazosin. Terazosin. Yeah, to make a urinate. Oh, Flomax? Makes... Is it Flomax? No. Well, maybe it is. You know, I'm not as up on the uh, the prostate meds as I am. No, it's Hytrin. Hytrin. Hytrin is an alpha adrenergic blocker to treat high blood pressure and an enlarged prostate. And it's a it's a medication that can help you pee. But I help. Yeah, I mean, it, it would help, but it doesn't necessarily fix the underlying problem. Right. And so that's what okay. we have to understand is what's the underlying problem. And given the fact that you had Hunter's lesions and you've had pain for a significant period of time, there's no doubt in my mind that your muscles have reacted to that pain and they're probably quite tight now. And so have them check to see if you're, how your muscles are, okay? Okay. Okay, hon. Well, it was great talking to you. Then, hey, listen... I love it when people call me and they, and they just, I have to pull information out, but we just pulled some really good information from you. And I hope that that helps in some way. And I hope you'll report back and let us know what the doctor says. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Carry hope in your heart, my friend and happy Valentine's day. Happy so, Valentine's day. 
All right. So Ruth on Facebook says, does menopause make IC bit worse or better? No, it makes it worse because your bladder needs estrogen to produce mucus. And so it's very common for women, especially if you're in your 30s or 40s, you're drinking coffee and stuff every day. And all of a sudden, sometime in your 50s or 60s, it starts to hurt. And you think it's infection, but in fact, it's estrogen atrophy. Um, so, yeah. All right. Let us go to, um, I think it was uh, Karen. Was it Karen who came in next? Karen? Let's unmute you. Or Karen, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. Yeah, I'm muted. Hey, Karen, how are you today? How is life? Um, I, I'm just having a horrendous pain for the last, oh, it's probably been seven or eight months, and it's all... At, it's all in my urethra and, and the, the bottom of my bladder. So when I'm walking, it feels like I've, I've got a sort of a ball. Okay. How old are you, hun? 54. Okay. So, so you're having horrendous pain at the bottom of your bladder and in your urethra. And when you're walking, it feels like you're there's a ball there, a, a a foreign object, or is it heavy? Yeah, it just feels like a. Yeah, it just feels like a, it just feels like all my insides are falling out. Okay. I I've I've got di I got diagnosed with IC probably about eight months ago, um, and I've had six bladder installations. Um, I haven't been given anything for the pain or anything to help, which is why I've been coming on to you and sure. looking at taking all the different sister project and stuff like that. Well, let's see. Let's, okay. So again, we can't talk about treatments until we anatomy. So we have to talk about your anatomy first. So tell me about this ball sensation. Um, do you only feel it when you're walking? Um, is it is it a downward sensation? It feels like something's falling out of you. Yeah, I I, I, I suppose it it's um, for the ladies with us. It's it's like having a really really bad heavy period. We just feel like everything's <laughs> falling out. Okay, um, I had a hysterectomy in two thousand. It's, it's nothing to do with that, but. Um, you know, I've done all the bladder training because I was going to the loo in 20 minutes, four hours. But as soon as I start walking, I need to go straight away. Okay. Okay. So there is a post-operative complication to hysterectomy that is uh, like a vaginal prolapse. And I forget the exact name of it. I know that they checked me for it. With my hysterectomy that I had in 2017, it felt like there was a hand up my vagina grabbing on to my scar where my cervix used to be and trying to pull it out of my body. It was a, a deep pulling sensation and very creepy and uncomfortable. Does that ring a bell? Do you feel a pulling? Um, no, it's, it's, um, it, I think it's just because because the pain is so bad. I haven't been doing, uh, you know, a lot of exercise and things, and so I think it's just really weak pelvic floor. So it just feels like nothing's holding it up. I'm sorry, I'm not making much. Sense, no, no, you're I? no, no, hon, you're fine. You're fine. You're doing you're doing just fine. Okay, let's try this another way. Describe the quality of the pain. Is it sharp or dull? Um, it, the, the pain, yeah, it's sharp. It's sharp. Okay. Is it? It's a sharp pain, but it feels. Okay. Do you ever have pins and needles? Do you ever feel like you're being stabbed, like with a giant needle? No. Okay. No. What? Um, and we know that movement makes the pain start and movement makes it worse, correct? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. So anytime movement is triggering pain, we're always going to look at muscles. The bladder does not, bladder pain is not really affected by moving or walking. Floor pain is affected by moving or walking. Tell me, does the pain get worse when you sit down? Or no, does... it goes away when I sit down. Okay. Um, um, is there anything that triggers the pain? Um, no, it's, it's just when I stand up and I walk. If, I, if I'm sat down, I sit down all hunched up. And, um, you know, it's, it's not there then. If I'm walking about, um, okay. you know, it, it starts straight away. Um, um, does the pain get worse if you lift your knee? Yes. Okay. Is the pain worse on one side and not the other side? Do your left side and do your right side. The pain's, the pain's worse on my left side. Okay. Okay. So there we go. So, um... Did they do a total hysterectomy or did they leave your ovaries? They did a total hysterectomy. Did they take your cervix? Yes. Okay. Um, can you try it? I want to try something else. Okay. So here's my fat COVID stomach, guys. So, so look, here's my hip bone right here, right? Okay. Not that you need to see my fat stomach. So here's my hip bone. I want you on your left side to put your fingers right on the inside of your hip bone and gently push in. Painful? Yes. Okay, do it on the right side. Push in. Is it painful? Yes, I've always had a pain that left hand side there. Okay, and right here below your belly button, push in there. Is it painful? No. Okay. So we're these are these are pelvic floor muscles right here. Those are pelvic floor muscles. Those are pelvic floor muscles that attach the inside of your hip bones. And so let's get this. So let's get this map. So if this were bladder pain, your pain would be centered directly above your pubic bone. You're having pain to the left, to the left of center. And if we look at the pelvic floor here. So here's the inner model, and I want you to see, look, you can see that the pelvic floor muscles, whoops, go right up along the inside of the hip bone, right here. Yeah. So we got piriformis yeah. muscles and we got obturator muscles. So have you had a pelvic floor, yeah. have you had a pelvic floor assessment? Um, he, he did a slight pelvic floor assessment and he sent me off, um, to, to you know to do exercises with um a physiotherapist okay and did you do that i have i've been to see her twice but we're in lockdown since january so i've only seen her twice okay okay um, and um this is what i want you to do i want you to go over to amazon and you should be able to get this book for free on Kindle Unlimited, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. Okay. And and the and so this is an this is a master class in pelvic anatomy. It's so good. Um uh, so it will show you where the muscles are located, where the ligaments were located, where the blood vessels are located. The good news is you don't have nerve pain. You're not having pins and needles, you're not having electrical pain. What you're having is pain when you start to move your muscles. And yeah. so so it sounds to me like you need to have a pelvic a proper pelvic floor examination and you need to tell them that your pain is dominantly on the left side. You need to tell them that the pain gets worse when you lift your knees 
and when you press on the inside of your hip bone. And um, my guess would be, now this is a guess, isn't it? Fact, yes. is that this is a legacy of the hysterectomy, that your muscles went into a strong tension pattern after the hysterectomy, which is what mine did. But our, my, so what happened for me with my hysterectomy, and again, let me go here. My, oh wait, where is, okay. So this is the inside, this is the outside. And there are three layers of muscles. So imagine your knuckle joints. We've got shallow muscles, mid-level muscles, and deep muscles. Your levator muscles right here are the shallow muscles, right? So they go right around your urethra, vagina, rectum. Then we've got middle muscles, and then we've got super deep muscles, right? So you're having muscle pain probably from super deep muscles, your left pyramus or your left obturator, possibly. Whereas for me, after my, after my hysterectomy, it was my levators that were spasming. It was my levators that were giving me that pulling sensation. And so it took, uh, um, uh, so, when, so when you went to your physical therapist, did she do an internal examination? Um, yeah, she, she did. Yeah. And did it, it seem very thorough, but yes, she did. Did it hurt when she touched muscles? No, no. But she didn't do a very, did she, did she do a vaginal examination and touch muscles through your vaginal wall and go deeper or not? She did, but, but it didn't seem to be very deep when she did it. It just seemed to be very sort of light. Well, we have to rule stuff out. You know, what we have to do is make a list of potential things and you've got to try to rule them out. And I know with COVID right now, it's really challenging. Does heat help when you take a hot shower? Do you feel better? Yeah, a hot shower, hot water bottle, that all helps. Okay. Yeah. And so what does he what does he do? <coughs> heat relaxes muscle. Heat relaxes yeah, muscle. Exactly. So maybe what you could do is, until COVID gets a little bit better and you're able to do more appointments, I wonder if you could ask your the physical therapist to make an inquiry for you to see if they would give you a muscle relaxant. Like it would be it would be a very interesting experiment mm -hmm. to see if Valium, like a vaginal Valium suppository, or even oral Valium, or I use Flexeril, F-L-E-X-E-R-I-L, Flexeril. Flexeril is a skeletal muscle relaxant. All these muscles, skeletal muscles, your bladder is smooth muscle. Your pelvic floor is skeletal muscle. So they need a skeletal muscle relaxant. That, that's going to be allium. That's going to be Flexeril or baclofen, which is non-sedating. Like I took a half a flex last night because I'm really having problems with this compressed disc making, giving me tight muscles. So um, it would be a very interesting experiment to see if a muscle relaxant would be helpful. Um, okay, I, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, you're everything you're saying is pointing to muscle. You're not, you're not pointing to bladder pain for me. You're pointing okay. more to muscle pain. And, um, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. So it could be your SI joint. It could be your hip or it could be a legacy of the surgery. And this book will help you figure that out. So go get this book and, and, and listen, it's not a, it, it's a read. You're going to be back in college reading it. But I, as you read it, I, what I want you to do is visualize your pain. Try, like, for example, they do, yeah, okay. you know, with hysterectomy, they, they do cut some tendons and stuff like that. And so did it, did it all, yeah. did it immediately get worse immediately after the hysterectomy? 
No, because the history actually was in 2006, and I, it okay. was only two years ago I started okay. with the um, IC. Okay, so is there a chance? Did you fall two years ago? Did you? <coughs> I thought I thought your hysterectomy hysterectomy was in 2016, not 2006, but it's still worth checking yeah, out. 2006. Do you remember any yeah, other? Yeah. Anything else happened two years ago? Did you fall? Long car ride. Um, were you? A yeah, I, um, I started working. I, I started working. Um, um, you know, in, in London, which is it's it was an hour's train journey every day, and then you know six hours sitting at work. So I just started sitting all the time. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. So, nice. so the hysterectomy still makes sense because the hysterectomy could have created muscle weakness, muscle tension. Yeah. Yeah. And now, yeah. and I, I will tell you that the last train ride I took, which was up to Lake Tahoe, I ended up at the emergency room from the pelvic floor spasms. And I haven't, I haven't been on a train since. Um, and so now, you, now you're putting more pressure on your pelvic floor. And we have to throw in the fact that you are also in estrogen atrophy and muscles get weak without estrogen. Your muscles get, our muscles get weaker as we get older. So I hope that I've given you a few doors that you can try to open. So again, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. Again, you're not showing nerve pain as much because you don't have pain when you sit down, which would be pudendal neuralgia. You're not experiencing pins and needles on your skin or anything like that. The fact that your your pain gets worse when you start walking, that may, and that makes us really want to look at your pelvic floor. And then one of the symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction is feeling like there's a foreign object stuck up there. And that yeah. could that could be the ball sensation that you've been feeling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hon. Well, listen, Carrie, hope in your heart. Uh, there's a very, keep doing the hot baths, do hot shower or hot showers, heating pad, and see if your doctor might be willing to give you a little bit of a muscle relaxant. And the other thing to look for is in your local store, in your local health food store, if you can get there, I don't even know if you can get there, look for PEA, palmito ethanolamide. And that might help a little bit with pain. Mm -hmm. That might help a little with pain as well. You might even be able to get the formula they used in the IC research study, which comes from Italy. Uh, I, I think... Go ahead. Okay, great. I, I, I've been taking Sister Prozac. Should I carry on with that? Well, well, it might help with the estrogen atrophy for sure, you know, because you did have a hysterectomy you, and so mm -hmm. you are now in extreme estrogen atrophy. And so yeah. giving those, you protecting your bladder with some chondroitin and, and your urethra with a little bit of chondroitin makes sense. So I think that that's not a bad thing to be doing, but it's certainly not going to be helpful with a muscle issue. And you're really describing muscle issues. If you can't start your stream right away, that's usually tight pelvic floor muscles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I had I had bladder pain and, and pain up the bladder wall and the um, installations have, have managed to control all of that and stop it. But okay. I've just left this pain at, at the bottom of, yeah. Um, over on our website, we have a blog, the seven causes of urethral pain. Make sure you go through that too. You know, urethral pain. Okay, you, I will do. So you, I mean, you are in extreme estrogen atrophy. Urethra is dry. It could be something as simple as laundry detergent or fabric softener or wearing menstrual pads. If I put on a pair of underwear wash and tide, I will have urethral pain within five or 10 minutes. Uh, or a fabric softener, you know, you're mm -hmm. coating down there. That still doesn't explain why you have pain when you move, and that doesn't explain why you have that ball-like sensation. But that could be playing a role with your urethral pain. So look at those chemicals too. Okay. Oh, lovely. 
Yeah. Okay, hon. Listen, I hope yeah, you'll, I, will, Jay. I hope you'll keep Thank in you. touch and please send me an email. I see network at Mac.com. I'd certainly like to keep in touch with you and, and let's see what, and also listen, are you a health, are you a member of bladder health UK? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you know that they yes, do have, they do have a nurse on staff, uh, one day a week, I think it's one day a week or one day a month for your questions. And so please use their resources too. Um, they might be able to refer you to a more compassionate doctor if that's what you need, or at least give you an idea. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay, I will do, thank you. Okay, hon, big giant hug. Big giant hug to you. You're not alone, my dear. Let's see what we can do to get a few more answers here, okay? And listen, if the pain gets to the point that you're scared or you're shaking, Thank you, you so much. You know, if you're if you can't if you can't walk normally, um, you know, please go to the emergency room. Because sometimes getting that separate, okay. getting us, and, and again, I know COVID is is adding complexity here, but sometimes they don't take you seriously until you've been to the emergency room and getting another doctor's look at your body. And specifically, you describing the pain. Don't say I see. You describe the pain. It is on the left side. It happens when I lift my leg. We need to get an orthopedist to try to understand what's happening there too, okay? Even your primary care doctor, that'd be email to them. Why does my pain get worse when I lift my knees, okay? Okay, hon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. All right. Let us go to um, uh, Eric. Please be patient with me. I'm going to come to Maria next. Maria, are you there? Hello, Maria. All right. Maria is apparently not there, so we will mute her again and let us go to Mr. Eric. Hello, Eric. How are you doing today? You have to unmute yourself. How are you? Doing? Yeah. Um, well, it's been tough. I don't know. Uh, darn. You know, since our last conversation, um, no, no sodas or caffeine. Good. Um, uh, been eating. Um, you know, pretty basic foods, uh, meat, vegetables, um, some fruits. Okay. Um, and the, the main symptoms that I'm dealing with, which are annoying, is after I urinate, uh -huh. um, that whole penis area shaft can feel so irritated and I get like, touching it, you know, kind of massaging it because it's just kind of driving you crazy. Does that, when I explain that, does that make sense? Yes and no. Okay. Um, is it pins and needly on your skin? No, I would, no, it's not pins and needly. So there's no stabbing or sharp or feeling sharp loss, nothing like that kind of pain okay but just really i think if i said highly sensitized like you maybe still want to pee or it's still um you know i'm not retaining anything but it feels like oh it you know irritated highly sensitized um does that better description for you um, so sometimes what happens is a little bit of um, uh, allodynia. So allodynia happens when nerves near the injury also become sensitive. And so um, some patients report like for me, in my first year with my bladder screaming, I went into a deep allodynia where you couldn't touch my stomach all the way up to my belly button without it hurting badly. And it took about six weeks for that to go away. And that was just because the proximal nerves got super sensitive. 
is this new or is this? Well, um, yes, yes, it's new in the sense that, um, as I said before, you know, I had been off um, my medication, the oh, yeah. antidepressant, and it's Wellbutrin and Zoloft, and one of them is an SSRI. I hope that helps with information. And so I'm now just starting my fourth week. And usually when I'm getting back on these things, um, my whole central nervous system, I, I know I know that I'm experiencing high, high levels of anxiety. And I know that because like, say for instance, when I wake up in the morning, if I hear a cupboard door open, or I mean, this morning I made just a little noise with my mouth, but those things will startle me or I'll have some involuntary muscle movements, which mm -hmm. are symptoms of anxiety. So I know, I know that the, it's not like my body is perfectly calm. I know that. And I'm sure that's very much playing a part of it. Um, Are you doing stop sign, deep breath, minimize the thought routine? I'm using the, um, the, the deep diaphragmatic breathing. And I've been doing that exercise that we've done. What do you smell? Okay. What can you hear? What do you see? Okay. Now, that doesn't solve the problem, but I do it, you know? Well, it's almost, sorry, it's almost like I just have to keep going through it, but I'm like, I want this, <laughs> like everybody else, I mean, I hear these, you know, I want it to settle down, I want it to not drive me crazy, I want to, and I guess it just creates fear, and how long is this going to last, and will this ever end, and, you know, those catastrophic thoughts, you know. Well, I think, number one, you know, you've been dealing with this for some time mm -hmm. and it's not going to be an overnight fix. This is like you're building a new house brick by brick. Mm -hmm. Every day is an opportunity to create a, a and expand your foundation through small but meaningful acts. And so the fact that you're doing your deep breathing, the fact that you're trying to calm your central nervous system is the foundation for it all. So you're doing the work. Um, are your eyes bothering you right now? I'm just listening and stuff. Okay. I don't know if it's a weird habit. <laughs> no, it's not a weird habit. It makes total sense. Well, it took years it took years for you to get here and it's going to take a good amount of work and, and self-determination and persistence and commitment for you to move out of this and to, and to try to improve your, your body quality. And dude, you've got this, you got it. You can do it. I know you can do it. And this week you've made an important stride forward. You haven't had any soda, correct? Mm -hmm. So for people, yeah. I, yeah. 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 So for people who are watching and Eric, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, that, no, you know, we, we, there's definitely one of the challenges of soda is that it, it, it tricks the brain into thinking that energy is coming. If by putting something super sweet in your mouth, especially a diet soda, your brain prepares for that sweetness by thinking that um, food is coming. And when it doesn't come, it makes you, it, you start grazing. And it creates this vicious cycle of you're drinking because your brain wants to sweep, but there's no energy. So then you're eating more and then you're drinking more and then you're eating more and then you're drinking more. And the, the soda companies know it. All the companies know it. They're, all they want is for you to be a customer. So the more sugar they can give you, to trick your brain into developing that, that it's all better for them. It's bad for you and it's bad for us, but it's better for them. So you got stuck in that. I mean, you got really, really stuck in, in that in artificial sugar thing. And it's, but the thing is, is that you're now breaking out of that. You've had a week without it. Mm -hmm. No cheating. Did you throw yeah. did you throw it all out? You have no diet soda, no artificial sugar yeah. in your house, right? At my, at my mom's house, I mean, it's just water. Good. You know, it's just water. Good. 
Good. Yeah. And you've got chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea. Um, Can you do I those? Chamomile. I don't know if we have peppermint. Okay. Well, or even the Ruba. So I gave, we started this whole meeting with me talking about the coffee challenge. So I want you to be there with the, with the water and with the chamomile herbal tea or the peppermint herbal tea for at least three months. Mm -hmm. We got to calm everything down here because your nervous system has been tweaked and traumatized. And so we at least we'll be able to calm your bladder a little bit that way. And also just kind of, I mean, you know, you're, we're just making a healthier you. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then the, your, your other challenge is that, that you've been on antidepressants and off antidepressants and on antidepressants and off antidepressants. And that, yes. cre that creates its own rigorous challenge there. And you're now off everything, right? Or are you back on? No, I'm, I'm, I'm back on them now. Okay. It's just starting fourth week. Okay. Um, and so um, are you doing full dose, half dose? What are you doing for those? Um, I do full doses. I mean, just, uh, uh, you know, full disclosure. Um, I'm at the max dose of Zoloft, which is 200 milligrams okay. uh, per day. Okay. And I'm at the max dose of Wellbutrin, which is 450 milligrams per day. Okay. Now, do you have somebody that you get to talk to every week to just kind of go through some of this stuff that you're struggling with? Um, my insurance allows me to meet with this therapist once every couple of months i don't have a weekly um person okay you know okay um why don't when is your next appointment with her um i think it's in march okay why don't you ask her or even you could even email her if she has any home programs you can do, like on the internet, any, I don't, you know, any kind of workshops or uh, courses that you could take online that might help improve, I mean, just kind of give you a little bit more support and comfort to kind of get you through this. Maria, I have to mute you, hon. Okay. Um, uh, she, I, I was recommended a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Okay. Which is about how trauma and everything, how all these things, um, how they manifest in our bodies. Oh, yeah. So um, um, <laughs> you know, it's got a lot of neuroscience. And I know, you know, I, I've, I've said, I said, listen, I, you know, unless I've prayed, I said, God, you know, if I need to go to a doctor, you're going to have to tell me because at this point, I don't think a doctor can do anything. Well, me. I. I don't think I, I disagree. I mean, you still are a bit of a mystery to be solved. I don't want you staying at home and doing nothing. I think yeah. this is a combination of skill building and diagnostic work too. We've got to uh, really try to improve those anxiety management skills so that you can hit them full force. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're, I want you to be, you know, um, the best anxiety management person out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, the way you do that is by learning new skills. And so again, if she's got a course that you can take or thing that you can recommend, or even a support group that meets online that, that you can participate in, I, I, I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly support that. I think that mm -hmm. that would be great. I think having good positive reinforcement for you every single week is, is going to help you in the long run. I don't want mm -hmm. you suffering at home in silence alone. You've done nothing wrong. None of this is your fault in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. You know, you like I told you, you're like my brother, <laughs> yeah. right? My brother went through exactly mm -hmm. the same thing with you. I, the other thing I think that would be fascinating would be to, I mean, I know we talked about thyroid when we talked, didn't we? Have you had a, uh, yes. you had a thyroid panel done recently? Um, not recently, but in the last few years, yeah, and my thyroid was normal. Okay, okay. Um, um, 
quick question for you while yeah. you're thinking. Um, you know, because I think that these sensations, um, you know, ramp up and then let's say, you know, I'll get done urinating and then that will ramp up over an hour, an hour and a half. And then my bladder, you know, starts to kick in and I can feel that I'm, you know, I move away from the penile shaft sensation to, mm -hmm. you know, more of a, the bladder is going to need to void at some point. Yeah. So that to me says it's nerves. Am I on the right track that that's nerve stuff going on? No, it could be muscle stuff going on. It could be muscle. Yeah. So who, so who, so who, you know, I don't know the urologist, but who, who can help you? I feel pelvic floor therapist, but she's looked at my muscles and stuff and she says, no, they're fine, blah, blah, blah. But who really can help give you like, this is what's going on with you? Well, but it's a mixed bag, right, hon? Remember? A lot of different structures in your pelvis, and they're all working with each other and influencing each other. So, so your muscles are injured. Your, your muscles are involved. Your bladder is involved, and your penis is involved. And are you having any testicular pain at all? No. Interesting thing about this go around. Now, when I've been through this um, stuff before, I've had. Um, it was like a year ago, I had aching in the left testicle, uh -huh. so much so that I went and, you know, I was like, there's something going on there. And of course, you know, I tend to hyper focus. Yeah. And I was always feeling down there for, you know, structures. And I was starting to think maybe I have, I don't know if it's called a varicel or something. A varicocele. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. And so I actually had an ultrasound done for that. And that, there was nothing there. And eventually when my system kind of got regulated again, when my system regulates, all of this stuff calms the heck down. Well, I, you know, I don't want, I, listen, everybody's guessing at this point in time, right? We're mm -hmm. guessing. We're just trying to rule stuff out here. My concern is that you're blaming yourself for this. And, and I don't want you to, I don't want you to blame yourself for any of this. We just haven't found it yet. They just haven't found it yet. I think that there, you could fall into a trap of thinking that it's all in your head and it's all, and, and I don't want you to do that. I mean, um, uh, penile pain is not all in your head. It hurts. Right. It hurts down there. Your penis is involved mm -hmm. down there. Now, mm -hmm. and we have to figure out why. Mm -hmm. And it could, again, relate to a long-term chronic hip problem or an SI mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be the foundation for all of this. And so you really are still at this point in time, an anatomical mystery to be solved. The, mm -hmm. the, the thing is, is you've had all the prostate work up, correct? Yeah. Okay. I have PSA. So no one marks prostate. Good PSA. Yes. Okay. So, so the next question then is going to be a joint. Could it be your SI joint? Could it be your hip joint? It's possible. It's possible. And even that left side testicular pain still could be related to a left side musculoskeletal you know, dysfunction. So David, you know what? You're going to be the recipient of the freebie of the day. I have one copy of this to give away. And if there's anybody who would benefit from this book, it is you. Okay. So David, open your eyes. <laughs> I'm going to send you this book. Because okay. this is the book which is going to, and uh, as you read this book, I want you to think about your bowel, go through every chapter, and let's try to understand anything and everything that could be contributing to this pain, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, could it be a tendon problem? Could it be a, a neuroinflammatory problem? Could it be a neurological problem? Could it be a lig? For all we know, it could be a bad ligament mm -hmm. in your hip. So 
I want you, would you please do me a favor and email me mm -hmm. your mailing address? I don't remember your last name. I think I have you in our system, but I see network at Mac.com. Would you please reach out to me? And yeah. you're going to get this book. Okay. And let's Thank try you. to open as many books as we can. But please, please, dude, stop beating yourself up. Yeah. I can, yeah, I think, I can yeah. see it in your face. You've done nothing wrong. This is not your fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. We have to, we just still don't understand the landscape. We don't understand the anatomy. And so um, let's try to rule out as many other things as possible. Let's open as many doors as possible. I think it'd be really cool to go see an orthopedist and explain your symptoms and say, I'm here because I want to see if I have any bony issues, any SI joint hip issues that could be contributing to this pelvic pain. Would you please check it out? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yes, All right, dude. You. Okay. You pop me an email with your info and I'll get it out to you um, on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Nice talking to you. And now yes. we're going to go to Maria. Maria, hello, Maria. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I'm so sorry I got trouble with. Oh, no, no, no. It's okay, hon. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I guess I don't want to make my story long, so I'm just going to try to. Well, I had, um, I was diagnosed with IC a year and a half ago. Uh -huh. And for a year, I was, well, my problem started, and I've been thinking about what you've been saying about the physical anatomy and the relationship between uh, what goes on on your body and yeah. your bladder issues. Yeah. And I have immune diseases. I had lupus at some point. Okay. I'm in remission for a number of years. Okay. And uh, I have Sjogren's. I okay. have Sjogren's. Okay. And uh, have thyroid disease. And then two years ago, more or less, I had a, a, some coccyx pain that started on one side of my coccyx that, and they did scans and they didn't find anything, only a little bit of a scoliosis on my um, uh, spine. And then I had three or four UTIs. And the last one was when I was abroad, we were in Ukraine and, and I ended up in the hospital because it was severe and they did a cystoscopy. They didn't find anything. When we came back to, the, to this country, we, I went to the doctor, I went to a, a urologist and didn't find anything. And uh, he ended up saying, actually by my own suggestion, because I had read and talked to a friend who had IC, and uh, she suggested that with all my problem, it, problems, it was probably IC. So a year and a half ago, uh, it was, we left it at that. And I started a diet. I started to take the, to taking uh, aloe vera. And then I stopped. And, and then um, in June this year, exactly a year after my last UTI, I started to have UTIs again. So I had eight UTIs in the past, since June last year. Okay, so and, okay, so let me stop you here for a moment. What was the bacteria? What was the bacteria? Different bacteria. I mean, I looked at all of them. Some of them were uh, the E. coli. Okay. And some of them were some something else. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, but there were two different ones, and I I thought that could be the problem that it was the same one that maybe. And, and that's what my husband was thinking. Maybe it's the same bacteria that just gets, that it doesn't get out of your body. But then we realized it was different ones. You know, it was either one of two. And so then I went to see a pelvic gynecologist, a specialist who ultimately referred me to a urologist who I am seeing since a month ago. And, but the gyno urologist had um, put me on macrovid, 
for six months, January, and methanine and estrogen. Okay. Now the estrogen, I had I had a lot of gynecologists that in the past told me that I should start on estrogen, mm -hmm. but I had this weird reaction of breast pain in the past and I couldn't take it. Yeah. So not even they suggested that I should take like a little, uh, just to put a little bit on my vagina. So, but this last kind of urologist suggested Vagifem, the inserts. Okay. And that worked. It okay. hasn't given me as much breast pain. Okay. So I'm on that and I'm on the macro bit. The problem is people getting them, the, the UTIs. And... I still don't know whether I am, and I think that's part of the IC because I still don't know whether I have a UTI. Well, but I okay. So, so the way to know one way, the way to prove it one way or the other is to have a next generation DNA urine test. That's what I was going to tell you. He, okay, so it's a DNA. DNA a DNA, a next generation yeah. DNA urine test. Did they do that already? No, but tomorrow I'm going to go see him. And he said, he suggested to have that, uh, a DNA test. Good. And he didn't mention that it was a next generation, but he said DNA test. And he said, well, maybe it's an expensive one. And I said, no, no, no. At this point, I really need to have it because I need to know. And what does that test do? Well, it just, it, rather than trying to grow bacteria, what it does is it studies what's in your urine. And so it looks for traces of DNA and RNA, but mostly DNA. And it will, based upon what it finds, the pieces of DNA it finds, it will tell us what's in your urine, good bacteria, bad bacteria, fungus, and maybe even virus. Okay. And, and if you're positive UTI, you are excluded from a diagnosis of IC. You are in it. You are a a bacterial cystitis patient rather than an interstitial cystitis patient. I you, see. Okay. And so, so there are a couple of things that we would be looking at and, and remind me to come back to the tailbone pain, because I actually think that's really important, but for in women who get recurring infections, and I attended a whole class on this, they've studied them intensely. And what they find is that 24 hours before the bacteria arrives in the bladder, it's usually quite happily living in the vagina. And that made the researchers ask the question, why has the vagina become a safe haven for bacteria? The answer comes right back to estrogen atrophy and aging. That your vagina does not have the normal defenses that would normally prevent the bacteria from living in your vagina. And it does it two ways. You lose that mucus, your tissues become dry. And then because they're dry, it's easier for the bacteria to actually infect that tissue. But also as we age, the pH of our vagina changes and becomes more hospitable, hospitable, hospitable. What's it? You know what I mean? Um, and so sometimes they might give you some like boric acid suppositories too. Um, but, you know, the first thing we really, really want to look at is just the quality and health of your skin. And, and in addition to giving you antibiotics, they would give you normally a topical estrogen to use in your vagina, which the Vagifem is, to try to build your vaginal defenses. Okay. And so that, how old are you? I'm 59. And, and how long has it been since you've had a period? Oh, well, I had a hysterectomy when I was in my 30s. Okay, so you are extremely estrogen atrophied then. And so, yes, so. Probably. Yes, I, I am. Actually, okay. I was. Okay. And actually for about two years, I've been on reverie because I didn't know I could take the estrogen because I kept on having, when they put me on estrogen the first time when I was on the beginning of my fifties, right. I had this horrible reaction on my breasts. Right. And I actually kept on having every time somebody suggested another kind of estrogen, including estrogen, 
uh, including, I don't know, other Chinese project, uh, products that people suggested, I, I still had the same reaction. So I was kind of leery when the, the last gyno urologist yeah. suggested the, est the, the estradiol, the Vagifem, but it's, it's worked. It's, good, it's, good. So, it's so that's important. And you're probably going to be using that for the rest of your life. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. But the problem is my cholesterol has gone up. Hmm. And my blood pressure has gone up. So now there's a thing that the estrogen might be causing up. So I am really, and also I have liver problems. So it's not like I can have any kind of medication all the time. Right, right. So well, well they, they, yeah. My, my hepatologist is having me uh, have tests every two months now. And I'm due to, to have it in another month or so just liver tests to make sure that my liver is okay. Uh, and good. That's good. Because the other, you have, we have two other complicating factors. We have the Sjogren syndrome and mm -hmm. Sjogren syndrome uh, dries out mucous membranes. So you've got yet another reason for your mucous membranes to be dry. And the other thing I think that's just so interesting here is that you had pain on the left side of your tailbone. Right. And did you do you remember fall uh, falling at all? It, the only thing that I remember is that I used to uh, do exercises on the floor, floor exercises, and I think that's what it caused it. And then it got it gets aggravated every time we travel, which we haven't because of the the, the, the virus, but. Uh, if I have, if we have to take a long flight, you know, an eight hour flight, it's, it's a killer for me. I have to get up and walk a little bit. And uh, the way I, it, it's much better. I tried acupuncture and I tried different pillows and I could sit now, which at the beginning I couldn't even sit. So uh, it's much better, much, much better that I can deal with because it only, you know, I have to kind of switch the way I sit to my right side instead of the left side. But okay. as long as I'm, I have a pillow, the right pillow, I can, but I saw a, a, a pillow that you guys sell that I might buy to there at the IC network. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, but you're, do you see a connection with the, the that kind of pain there and the, the coccyx pain? Well, we absolutely now, with the help of the, the with the help of this new book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, he talks. He was the first one to really talk about the high incidence of tailbone injuries in IC patients. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I'm stunned by the number of IC patients that I talk with who do have tailbone injuries. I had a tailbone injury in seventh grade when my symptoms began. I broke the tip of my tailbone off. And so, um, you know, what that's going to do potentially is if the tailbone heals out of position, that's a problem because that's going to be stressing nerves and muscles. Um, uh, it's, it, it's creates kind of chaos for lack of a better term in the pelvis when you when you have a pale, tailbone injury it it feels like it affects almost everything it affects the muscles it affects the nerves you've got a lot of nerves coming off of your sacrum right above your tailbone so you know having a, a pelvic floor assessment and and the reality is is that is that again you like the other person you, you're clearly having some muscle symptoms and the way you sit matters and so that again is pointing to muscles and nerves to me. So, you know, I, I don't know why you've had so many infections. The only the, there you either have something inoculating you at home, or you're showing some, or you're becoming a bit immune compromised. Uh, I or, do you know, I I brought up the immune system with my. Both, both of my doctors and also with my general, with my GP. And also I wanted to mention, oh, well, it just escaped my mind now, but. Um, hmm. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I just forgot. I was going to tell you. That's something. okay. It's a, it's a.
It's a Sunday. Yeah. It's a Sunday and I'm really nervous about this. Oh, I mean, don't, I, don't, don't be nervous. I mean, again, there are just things we have to rule out, but you have a complex UTI. It is very, yeah. very, it's not a simple UTI. It's a complex UTI. It's very important it that you start keeping meticulous notes on Yes, the, I am. The I type, am. the type of bacteria it is. Yeah. And we're going to want to try to understand a little bit more about is it the same bacteria or different bacteria every time? You might even do well consulting with an infectious disease specialist. I, I've been thinking about that. And the other thing that I've noticed and that was, I guess, next one of my questions was sometimes I don't have I don't have all the symptoms, but I just feel a little bit of this here uh, when I sit, especially when I sit too long. Mm -hmm. And then I I had my annual the other day with the GP and she said, and I said, please, you know, uh, check my urine. And she says, well, do you have any symptoms? And I said, I don't, but I do feel a little bit uncomfortable down there. And she she didn't want to, and I and I insisted. And then she calls me on Saturday and she says, you have a UTI. I'm like, it's the thing is, sometimes I, I have a UTI when I don't even, or, or maybe I have gotten used to the discomfort there mm -hmm. to a point where I don't know whether I'm in pain or not. If yeah, it, it's, I, I don't. With a lot of older people, they get bladder infections that an actress just died of a very, very acute bladder infection. She had no idea she had a bladder infection and she became septic and she passed away. I forget, I forget who she was, but it all came back I to a bladder that. infection. I keep that because I, I, two years ago when I started with the bladder infection, more than two years ago, I mean, it must have been three or four years ago, I ended up in the hospital yeah. because I didn't know, because I left it, you know, I was feeling uncomfortable. And it was one of those UTIs that I got once a year and I started bleeding and I started shivering and I had fever yeah. and yeah. ended up in the emergency room. Yeah. Well, so also talk to your doctor about using Allura, a PAC product. It would be interesting to see if something like that, the Allura would be helpful, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, or prevent. But, you know, Allura has been around for a long time and has a very good track record, as somebody said <laughs> earlier. So the Allura might might be an interesting option for you. But, you know. You're, you're a bacterial cystitis patient right now. You're a genital urinary syndrome of menopause patient right now. You might have some pelvic floor issues due, due to the tailbone. And so, but well, all they, they, the first doctor that I saw, the gynecologist was also a pelvic floor doctor. Mm -hmm. And he did a very thorough examination. Uh, so he didn't find anything. I mean, and he's a specialist. He does the surgeries and all of that. And he ended mm -hmm. up sending me to a urologist because he, he is a mainly uh, surgery guy. He doesn't do common cystitis. That's what he told me. So, well, but, was... but, but yours is complex. you you, because you've had so many of them, you have a complex UTI that you would never be diagnosed with a simple UTI with having eight infections in the last year. So, uh -huh. um, I, I think that from a priority standpoint, the, your priority has to be focused on trying to figure out why you're getting infections. And, and then number two, doing everything that you can to improve the quality and health of your skin, which you're doing with the Vagifem. Um, mm -hmm. you know, combine maybe with the Allura, something like that, to see if that would be helpful, Allura well, or Prevent. Allura is in, improves the acidity of the bladder? You'll have or? to know it's a PAC product. Just Google it, E-L-L-U-R-A, okay? Okay, because listen. I wonder if it's like the methanine that I'm taking. But, but methanamine is not a preventative. It's, it's not quite the same preventative. Okay. Uh, Elora with the PACs has a, the research is very solid behind the use of PACs. So the PACs, paranthocyanidins come from cranberry, but it's not acidic. You don't have to worry about that. There's no cranberry juice in Elora, but you know, okay. you are in a completely different situation. So I would, 
Uh, next gen tests would be fascinating. Working with an infectious disease, disease doctor would be fascinating. Um, and uh, there you go. All right, listen, hon, I'm going to have to wind this up. Thank you for coming in. Please keep Thank in you. touch, okay? Thank you. Okay, hon. Bye bye. Bye bye. All righty. So we're going to end the Zoom meeting. The Zoom meeting is bye. All right, guys, last call for questions. Last call for questions on Facebook and YouTube. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Listen, if you find these meetings helpful, please come on over to the IC Network and become a member so you can get our wonderful magazine. So this is... Um, now the, IC, the IC Network has been rated... The most accurate, reliable, and credible website on IC in two peer-reviewed medical studies, one by Harvard Medical School and the second by the University of London in the United Kingdom. We're very proud of that. You can, I curate all of the information on the IC network. I'm always working on it, um, but it's a giant website and updating it is challenging at times. This is important. This is the most important article I've written in 28 years because we now understand why so many patients get IC, IBS, fulvodynia, TMJ, fibromyalgia, why those come together. You know, and they, that IC subtype 5, central sensitization, the connection now is the central nervous system. That, that, and it's uh, fascinating. Um, you know, let's see here. Hold on. Pamela says, husband trying to find the new book on pelvic pain. Lots of them. Yeah, I know there are lots of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Breaking through chronic pelvic pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. The author is Jerome Weiss. Let me just type that in there. Okay. So why do some patients end up like me with chronic overlapping pain conditions? So I had frequency urgency in seventh grade. I had vulvodynia in high school and college. I threw, started throwing ovarian cysts in college. Got IBS in my 20s, my first federal job. I see in my 30s. And um, why? I mean, I always felt like it was kind of my fault. I felt like I was being punished. I felt like I was damaged goods. And Thankfully, we have new research now that shows that in some cases there's hereditary going on. My sister has this. My mother has this. My grandmother has this. My aunt had this. My cousin had this. So I was able to finally realize that it wasn't me, that I inherited a more sensitive nervous system. And its class is characterized by extremely sensitive skin. We tend to be drug sensitive where a normal dose doesn't work. We have to use a half dose, a quarter dose of meds. We tend to be food sensitive. Uh, we have a wicked sense of smell. We can smell things that other people can't smell and smells tend to drive us crazy. We can be hearing sensitive, even visually sensitive, where if there's a funky pattern in a carpet or a wallpaper, we turn away. So what is that all about? And now we know, but um, here, hold on. Kayleen says, I lowered my visceral because of hair loss. You had hair loss with visceral? I took visceral for 10 years. I never had hair loss from it. Wow. Uh, now I'm going three to four times a night. I know I'm too young for that. So Kayleen, so the fact that an antihistamine was helpful is good. So you could try another antihistamine. You know, I think Claritin, is, is Claritin another? You know, talk to your doctor about another antihistamine. Maybe the over-counter antihistamines would be better for you and not cause those issues. But also quercetin, the, the, you, most of the, you, uh, the supplements that are used by urology patients have quercetin in it because quercetin has an antihistaminic effect. And so all the ones that Cysto products, the bladder builders, the bladder rest, the cysto mens, they all have quercetin in it for an antihistaminic effect. So you could maybe try that. Maybe that would be a, an option. Tamara says she healed herself. Ruth says a year after I had my daughter, uh, my IC developed. I'm a fit, active person with a variety of diet, quite healthy, hardly drink. It just came on. So, Ruth, the very first thing we would look at then is pelvic floor injury. It's very common for patients to develop IC symptoms after having a baby, especially if the baby, if the delivery was rough or you suffered a muscle tear or something like that. So 
So Tamara is gets getting great results with aloe. And she says as soon as she has an occasional symptom, she goes back to using a little bit of aloe. Okay, so let's talk about this chronic overlap pain conditions for a moment. So why does that happen? Now we today, and that was the theme of the International Pain Society meeting in, in October. And in fact, the study they used was a woman who as a teenager had painful periods and then in her early 20s was diagnosed with endometriosis and had uh, laparotomies for the endo. And then she had bowel symptoms and then she had bladder symptoms and then vulva symptoms. And as she got older, she just seemed to have more pain conditions. So why does that freaking happen? Um, the, the first clue was done by the Chronic Pain Research Alliance, and they were doing a lot of brain scans. And what they noticed was that people who have chronic overlapping pain conditions, and again, I'm one of them, our brains are functioning differently. And our own National Institutes of Health also started doing brain scans with chronic pain patients. And guess what? They also found that our brains were functioning differently. And in fact, what was happening is that our brains were stuck or are stuck in what we call fight or flight. So you have two nervous systems in your body. You've got the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is what is supposed to be operating every day keeps you calm, collected, it helps you function during out the day. The sympathetic nervous system kicks on when you're, when you're um, uh, startled or scared. Because remember, your brain's job is to save your life. If you were to walk, open your front door and there was a saber-toothed tiger across the street, you can damn well bet your brain is going, uh-oh, my life is at stake. And that's when the sympathetic nervous system takes over. Specifically, the amygdala in the brain takes over. And it's preparing you to fight for your life or run for your life. So what happens to the sympathetic nervous system and the amygdala and causes immediate changes, your heart rate goes up your blood pressure increases, your muscles get tight because it's preparing you to, to uh, it's trying to prepare to save your life. But normally you close the door, the screen door is open, the saber tooth tiger walks away and you walk it and it's far away. That's when your parasympathetic nervous system takes, it's like, <sighs> Okay, the threat is gone. And the parasympathetic nervous system calms your heart rate. It reduces your blood pressure. It relaxes your muscles, okay? So what the research showed is that many of us, chronic pelvic pain, we have what we call a central nervous system maladaption. All And it's not a mental illness. Don't worry about that. It's basically that you're stuck in fight or flight. You're stuck in anxiety. What's a dominant symptom it is massive anxiety. I had massive anxiety as a kid and in my 20s, massive anxiety. And I've explained why we had my neighbor was raped and murdered. And we had, a, you know, we had a criminal. We had a violent person in our neighborhood for years. Every time I opened my door, I went into fight or flight. And my brain basically just kind of got stuck there. And um, the great, great news here is that we know how to fix it. We know how to fix it. And it's with something called mind-body medicine. Now, I know as soon as I say that, some of you are going to go, oh, my God, Jill, shut up. My bladder is screaming, don't talk to me about mind-body medicine, because that's exactly what I did when my doctor at my very first appointment suggested that I do that. It's like, dude, I can't sleep through the night. I'm in agony. Don't talk to me about going to a therapist and learning about mind-body medicine. For God's sake, help my freaking bladder. I'm peeing all the time. I was offended. Didn't understand. 
like many of you don't understand. But he was right. And so, um, wicked sense of uh, wicked sensitive skin. I've got it. A wicked sense of smell. I have found more gas leaks in my neighborhood. My gas company offered me a job because I could walk through my neighborhood and find gas. I found three in the last five years. And they're like, how the hell do you do that? Wicked sense of smell. Smell is a brain function. So I want you to think about your brain for a moment here. So remember the purpose of your brain is to protect you and to save your life. It is, it is, it remembers everything. Things you cannot even remember. It is all stored in your brain. And as new things happen, your brain refers to your past history. If you're in the middle of the day, you smell something weird, your brain's going, okay, has she ever smelled this before? So the way your brain operates is not only by referring to your history, it's also paying attention to your senses. What are you looking at? Ah, you saw a saber-toothed tiger. Yeah, your brain immediately reacted. What do you smell? You smell something burning. Your brain will immediately react. What do you touch? You touch a hot stove, your brain goes, oh, crap, and immediately pulls your brain back. I mean, pulls your hand back. Your brain functions and processes information using your senses. But when you're stuck in fight or flight, your brain doesn't do that so well. So how do we get that? How do we get the sympathetic nervous system turned off and the parasympathetic nervous system turned on? Is we invoke the senses, mind, body, medicine. Like, oh my God. Now, I didn't talk about the brain scans because I didn't want to scare people five years ago, seven years ago. I didn't really understand them. Now I understand completely. So with mind-body medicine, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the parasympathetic nervous system. I mean, the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to turn on the parasympathetic. So let's do it right now. Let's do it. We're going to do it two ways. First way we're going to do it is we're going to do it with something called tapping. So what we're going to do is we're going to touch different parts of your body from this, from this place up. And that's going to force your brain to pay attention to what we're touching. Okay. So let's, so it's called tapping and you can go to YouTube and you can see lots of videos. I will tell you the research behind it is stunningly effective that with tapping, we can get you out of fight or flight for an hour or two. And they do it with uh, veterans coming back with severe PTSD. It's so good. So let's just go through a tapping routine real quick. Okay. So we're going to start on your karate chop. So I want you to karate chop seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And your brain's going, why is she tapping her arm? Okay. One, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then normally I would also want to say something affirming like, um, yeah, I have pelvic pain, but I, I love myself. Something like that. Okay. And the next place we're going to tap is right where our eyebrows begin. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, I have IC, but I love myself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got pelvic pain, but it doesn't change me as a person. I'm a good person. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. We're going to go right here. Oh, no, we're going to go right here on the bones, right, right on the side, not in your temple, but in the bones. Let's do it there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, I have IC, but I love and appreciate myself. I'm a good person. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, now we're going to go here in your cheekbone. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got IC. No big deal. Doesn't say anything about me as a person. I'm a good person. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, God, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm working hard. I've never worked as hard as I am right now. Okay, now we're going to go right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I've got, I see. I got pelvic pain. Don't say anything about me. One, two, three, seven. Yeah, God, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got, I see, I got, I have pelvic pain. I'm a good person. Now we're going to go right here. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Say something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, now we're going to go to your collarbones. I want you to find your collarbones. I feel like I'm crooked. Okay, like, okay, where are my collarbones? I keep going to one side. Well, anyway, find collarbones and then kind of, kind of go an inch below and an inch to the side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I've got IC, but it doesn't say anything about me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, man, I got IBS. I'm a good person. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and then and then we're gonna go on your bra strap for women right here or under your shoulder, not in your armpit, down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, I got IC. No shame. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I'm a person. This doesn't say anything about me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And last but not least, top of the head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Gosh, that kind of hurt. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what this is doing is this is forcing you out of fight or flight. It is forcing you out of fight or flight. Now, the second thing that we can do is called I spy. And let's close the meeting with this. Although if you have any more questions, last call for questions, last call for questions, we are winding down, right? All right. So with I spy, what we're gonna do is we're gonna invoke the senses and we're gonna, again, we're gonna calm the central nervous system. We're gonna uh, calm and turn off the sympathetic nervous system and turn on the relaxation. So we're gonna invoke the senses. So I want you to look out of your room, just look around your room and pick something to look at. So I have a painting here that one of my neighbors did that I bought from her. It's a beautiful painting of a, of a golden hillside with a green tree in the background. Okay, so just look at that picture and take a nice slow deep breath in, out. Okay, now let's focus on hearing. Can you hear anything other than my voice? What do you hear? Like I hear somebody tinkering in the kitchen. So now let's just focus on that. In, out. What do you smell? Can you smell anything right now? Is dinner cooking? Do you have, uh, like I have, a cup of peppermint tea right here? Yum. Just live with the smell for a moment. Take a nice, slow, deep breath in. Out. Now I want you to touch something. Touch something. Okay, so that's what I'm going to touch. I'm going to touch. I'm going to touch this rough texture. Just touch something and make your brain focus on what you're touching because your brain's going, yeah, why is she touching that? I mean, it's not a threat. It doesn't hurt, but it's interesting. Look at all those textures. It's kind of cool, right? Let's take a nice, slow, deep breath in. Out. <sighs> now comes the fun part. What could you look at? that would immediately put a smile on your face? What could you look at that would make you blissfully happy? What would it be? And mm, for me, it would be uh, Yosemite, a waterfall in Yosemite. Okay, in. What could you hear that would make you blissfully happy? Would it be a child laughing? Would it be a, a, a church um, singing? Would it be uh, a, your favorite singer? Would it be rippling water, a waterfall? Think about that for a moment. So for me, it's going to be a John Denver song, Rippling Waters. Okay, in, out. <sighs> 
What could you touch that would make you blissfully happy? It would be, for me, it would be uh, an, an, any animal, a cat, a dog, petting a cat. Okay, in, out. What could you smell that would make you blissfully happy? Cookies, hot apple pie, a pie cooking, cinnamon rolls cooking, coconut. In, out. <sighs> what could you taste that would make you blissfully happy? Mm. You know, coconut gelato, coconut gelato, that would be amazing. In, out. <sighs> okay, that's called I spy. And you're going to notice you're calmer. You're calmer. You're calmer because, and the anxiety is on. It feels much better because you've turned off the anxiety center and you've turned on your parasympathetic nervous system. And so... In the class that I took, the most important part of the, the conference was um, the class on pediatric risk factors. Why do some people get stuck in fight or flight? And the answer is 80% of those children had a physical injury, like a really big injury. Something happened, like getting hit by a car, falling, breaking a tailbone. And you know, kids, man, do we tell our... Is a little boy going to tell his mom that he hit his t that he hit his uh, his piss on the bar of a bicycle and it hurt really badly and he couldn't pee right away? No, a kid's not going to tell it. It's going to be really bad for a, a young boy to say that. We had one research study that showed that if a young boy jammed his crotch on the bar of his bicycle even one badly, that by the time he'd be in his 30s, he'd have frequency urgency from that injury. That was published in the American Medical Association Journal. So we know physical trauma can cause a change in the nervous system, but about 20% of the kids had been abused or bullied. And now I'm in that group. I was not, well, I did fall and break the tip of the tailbone off, no doubt about that, because I used to move it around with my finger. But the other thing that happened, as I explained earlier, is that um, I lived uh, for, for several years with um, a criminal in my neighborhood. And I was one of many victims. Thankfully, he didn't murder me. He raped and murdered my neighbor. Um, and so you bet, damn well bet, I left my house in fight or flight from fourth grade to 10th grade, six years. And I think by then he was in jail. Um, I just yeah. remember the last time it happened, I was walking to high school. I, I rem That was the very last time it happened. And the example that I use is a new puppy. You get a new puppy. And you know, man, that puppy comes in happy, 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 tail wagon, tail wagon, tail wagon. Until, and, but then but you don't know it, but somebody in your family kicks it. You hear a yelp. They explain it. Oh, he just stumbled. The puppy comes back, happy, 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 happy. But then it happens again. Every day it happens. It might happen two or three times a day. And by the end of two weeks of that happening, you do not have a happy puppy anymore. That puppy is walking into every room, looking around, looking for the person who kicks it with his tail between his legs. His fur is tight. That also was me. And the effect of that has been lifelong for me. And on um, when we have our high school reunions, you know, 40 years ago, so it happened 50 years ago, 50 to 40 years ago, uh, I go to my high school reunions and we have a, a mini reunion of victims. And it, it was a lot of people, a lot of people were changed by this evil, evil person. Um, But here's the deal. Here's the deal. 
When I was, when my first year of IC, which was the first time I had, I mean, I had real bad bowel pain that resolved, but the bladder pain was insane. And I had a doctor say to me, he said, you will forever be a burden on your family. You will ever, forever have this pain. Get used to it. This is your life. And as offensive as that was, that's what woke me up. Because I went, wait, 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 wait. I have three college degrees. I have an award from the White House. I'll prove you wrong, you son of a bitch. How dare you say that to me? And that is when I started fighting. That is when I start. I committed myself to learning about this. I read, started reading everything about IC. But one of the things that I did early, early on that I think has made paved the way for me to be pain free now for years is I took. I was sick of the anxiety. I was sick of the anxiety, and I one day I was having panic attacks every time I went to the doctor. And I just went, enough, enough. I don't want to live this way anymore. I need help. And I took an anxiety management class that absolutely changed my life. I have not had a single panic attack since I took that class when I was 35 or 36 years old, including facing cancer. Not one panic attack. My parasympathetic nervous system controls everything now. I know what to do. As soon as I start feeling negative, as soon as I start feeling sad, I know what to do. I invoke my anxiety management points. And I think that's one reason why I got better. If, you li if you're living in fight or flight, if you're living in anxiety, your brain will intensify that pain. When pain is processed midbrain, your pain your brain is looking for context. It's trying to figure out if your life is at stake. Pain that is accompanied by anxiety will be intensified by your brain because your brain thinks your life is at stake. Pain that is accompanied by laughter will be minimized by the brain because your brain going, well, man, she's laughing. She's freaking happy. It must not be serious. And that, my friends, is your homework. For 15 minutes a day, I need you, number one, to do something for your bladder or muscles or practice your anxiety management. Mindfulness, mind body. You can get this magazine, for goodness sake, get it. It goes over everything. Go to Google. I mean, go to uh, YouTube, do some tapping. Do I spy 15 minutes a day. Make the commitment to do something to bring your body a little bit of peace. For 15 minutes a day, I need you to do something for your soul. Because listen, man, I know, I know you. I know you because I am you. You're thinking you're damaged goods. You're thinking that nobody will love you. Bullshit. You're hurt. You're just hurt. You got to do something to nourish your spirit and your soul. Whether it is taking a walk in the redwoods, whether it is making snow, a snowman on cold days like today, whether it is listening to something peaceful, do something that gives you comfort. For 15 minutes a day, I need to do something to improve your noggin here. Come on, guys. You got to get your, your knowledge level up here. Some of you have had unexplained explained pain for years, and you don't know why. Your bladder's well. Your bladder does. There's no problem with your bladder. So for God's sake, go to Kindle Unlimited. Get this brand new book produced by Harvard. I'm a co-author. Facing Pelvic Pain. It is free on Kindle Unlimited. And it will go through everything that could be triggering this pain. Your gut, your hips, your, or your bones, your nerves, everything. This will help you rule in or rule out potential causes. It's free, no excuses, one chapter a day or one chapter a week. We're trying to solve the mystery of your pelvic pain. If you're not getting bladder on bladder therapies, there's a reason why. It might not be your bladder. It could be a Tarlov cyst. It could be pelvic congestion syndrome. It could be endometriosis. It could be a bad hip. It could be a tailbone that's healed out of place. This book will help you understand many potential causes. And then last, but honestly, the most important 
for 15 minutes a day, maybe even for an hour a day, laugh. Let's get some humor back into your life. You know, I mean, listen, this is where TikTok is great. You can get lost in TikTok for an hour and laugh your ass off. Go to YouTube, watch some funny videos, watch a comedy on TV, not a drama, a comedy. We've got to get you laughing again. We need humor because pain that's accompanied by humor will be minimized by the brain. You can do this. I believe in you. So Julie, I've had IC since 2016. I have pain, bowel movement, bad pain is that IBS combo. It, well, I, again, Julie, in this book, which is also free on Kindle Unlimited, which again is the book for muscle issues and injuries, um, he talks about something that I had. I used to have in my 20s, really bad bowel pain. The bowel, the bowel looks normal. Suddenly you are bent over and screaming with this violent bowel pain for five or 10 minutes, and then it goes away. It's called Proctalgia Fugax. And, and it's a result of muscle and nerve issues. And so if you're straining to have a bowel movement, then you are pushing on muscles and creating muscle tension. And so uh, in all likelihood, it's probably pelvic floor pain, but there could be something funky with your bowel too. And that's exactly why you want to talk to a doctor about it. Let's just make sure. I mean, you know, listen, the secret to comfortable bowel movements is having eating fiber and drinking plenty of water. For a woman, you need 20 to 25 grams of fiber a day. And for a man, you need 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. And that's fiber. And that, that's not hard fiber cereal. It's good, healthy food. One serving of green peas is 13 grams of fiber. So if you're struggling with hard, painful stools that you're having to push to pull out, you need enough fiber. Add some fiber. You can Google what foods are high in fiber and really try to improve that. Count it up. 20 grams of fiber minimum for a woman to be normal. I went through a period, you know, I do this every couple of years where it's like six weeks to two months of just hard and uncomfortable. And I, this just happened to me over the holidays. And of course, what was I eating? I was eating a lot of, you know, non-fibrous foods. When I'm under stress, I go to cinnamon rolls. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of fiber in a cinnamon roll. Um, uh, so I always make sure that I have a really good serving of refried beans or green peas or something else that's really high in fiber every day. You know, I mean, it's just so incredibly important to, so my normal breakfast is, uh, two pieces of Ezekiel bread with either almond butter or avocado with cheese on it. That's eight grams of fiber. I'm going to eat one apple a gala apple or Fuji apple. That's another four grams of fiber. My snack in the afternoon might be pea chips or carrots or celery or something like that, or popcorn. Um, or, um, oh, and you know, what's interesting. So again, I an article on chocolate versus carob for the IC diet project, icdietproject.com. Carob is high in fiber. Oh, look at that. You can have a sweet that's kind of like chocolate, pertains pretty much like chocolate. You get a good fiber source there. So I might. So I ordered some carob chips last night. Um, and then for dinner, I always make sure that, you know, this is when split pea soup, bean soup. Uh, I'm starting to cook more with garbanzo beans, things like that. Because in my home, with a 98 year old and a 92 year old and a freaking 60 years old, it's all about peeing and pooping comfortably, to be blunt. All right, my friends, last call for questions. Julie says, I'm an Elevil, 25 milligrams and still getting pain. I'm going to see my another urologist because the last one had no hope. So, hun, Elevil will calm nerve pain if used over time. So what you've got to do when you go to the doctor is you've got to really clearly and specifically describe your pain. You can't walk in and say, I have bladder pain. That's not good enough. You got to say, okay, number one, you got to describe the quality of the pain. Is it sharp or dull? 
Where is the pain located? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? Is it centered? Is it inside of your body? Is it outside of your body? What makes the pain worse? Does the pain get worse when you sit down? Is it relieved by standing up? Or is it the opposite? Does the pain get worse when you stand up? Does the pain get worse when you start walking? What makes the pain better? Heat? Cold? If it's heat, then that's pointing us to muscle. If it's cold, that's pointing us to nerve. So you're, don't walk into the doctor's office and say you've got IC pain. Walk into the doctor's office and describe your pain clearly and simply, but fully. Your ability to talk about your pain and your symptoms is going to directly reflect the care you get. You can't walk in and say it hurts down there, make it go away, not even close to being good enough. You got to give them a roadmap. You got to give them clues. Does your pain get worse when you have your period? Does it get better when it goes away? Does the pain get worse when you sit in a car or when you have sex? Does the pain get worse when you eat something versus not? But focus on location. Is it to the left of center? Is it to the right of center? Is it low? Is it is it shallow? Is it deep? Is it in your urethra? Is it in your vagina? Is it in your rectum? Those are all important clues that will help the doctor figure out why you might be in pain, okay? Because that's the whole point of this meeting is we're all missing a lot of other things that can cause bladder pain or pelvic pain. You, sometimes it's not your bladder at all. Sometimes it's your bowel, your endometriosis, whatever, okay? All right, let me check YouTube one last time. Okay, you guys on YouTube. Hey, man, thank you for staying on YouTube. I appreciate that. Please like our page. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please come on over to YouTube. And if you could subscribe to our channel on YouTube, that's great because I'm trying to build that. Um, a lot of people are asking when I do these meetings. I try to do these meetings on Sundays, but I'm also doing drop-in meetings. And I will pick one platform, either Facebook or YouTube. For, so for you to know if I'm doing it, you got to subscribe and sign up for the notifications. All right. All right, my friends, big giant hug to you. I wish you the best. You got this. You can get through the next week. Look in the mirror and be proud of yourself because you are working damn hard. And just know that you've got thousands and if not millions of people standing by your side. You are absolutely not alone. All right. Okay, my friend, I will see you later. Be well. All righty then. Let's see here. Facebook. You're... Let me try this again. Facebook. What's wrong? I need to turn you off. <laughs> there we go. All right, YouTube. Facebook is done. It's going to be very interesting to see how the stream quality is because I'm on a brand new service with much better upload speed. So I'm hoping these videos will be much clearer. Thank you, Diana. All right, you guys, I wish you well. Have a good one. Happy Valentine's Day.